Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the People, Place and Nature podcast. We'll be talking with John Little about a range of topics, from the impact of how we manage our green spaces to weird things like how a shopping trolley in a pond can actually increase biodiversity by adding complexity to the ecosystem. But first, it's important to remember sustainability doesn't just relate to the environment. It relates to your finances as well. That's why we have switched to Beans Accountants. Beans operate on a package system, so you always know where you stand. We halved our accountancy costs by moving to them, and one of our associates just reduced theirs by two thirds. And with free tax advice and accountancy support, you cannot go wrong. So make sure you check out Beans Accountants in the description below. So, hi there, John. Thanks hi. so much for joining us today and having us in your wonderful garden. Um, incredible spot. Um, I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about some of the work you're doing with, with substrates and that type of thing and, and how you're looking at using, you know, what might otherwise be waste materials or, you know, for creating richer environments. Yeah, well, I guess, I guess what um, it feels to me like we, we've had this kind of, I suppose it's a traditional garden, uh, English garden tradition of, of, of fertile soils, lush foliage. And, uh, and I think the topsoil thing is, 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 is stuck in our head. So we tend to use topsoil as a, as a default um, covering. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we need to have a conversation that we don't have to do that everywhere. You know, it's yeah. got its place. Um, and I think especially um, when things are being built, so when there's any development, when there's any highways, when there's any scale of development, and there's the machinery on site, um, that is the time to look at the landscape, I think, and decide where you want the topsoil. Do you want it everywhere or would you, you know, and then can you use the mineral soils that are underneath? Can you mm. use some of the construction waste that you're creating? So in other words, try and use the stuff that's on site, but try and be creative about it and not just blanket topsoil everywhere. Exactly. So when, when you say topsoil, what would, would you mean by topsoil? So topsoil is the richer soil you find on the surface yeah, typically and what you kind so. of use with compost and that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, and it's the stuff that most gardeners assume you need to make mm. a garden good or yeah. to make a landscape good. Uh, and, I, and, and quite rightly, if you want to grow um, veg, you want to grow lush green foliage, then um, that's fine. You yeah. need fertile soil. But of course, in, in effect, what, what, we are, what we do as gardeners is uh, we basically fight against what topsoil wants to be. So topsoil mm. wants to be coarse grass, wants to be nettles, wants to be docks, wants to be scrub. Um, so we, as a gardener, you just, you, that's what you do. As a, you, you, mm -hmm. you garden to stop topsoil being what it wants to be. And I think as soon as you can look at soils and say, right, what sort of landscape do we want? You can dictate the landscape by the soil. And mm -hmm. so it flips around the other way. You know, instead of having topsoil and then thinking, right, I want it to be, you know, I want it to look like this. I want the vegetation to be low or I want it to do this, this and this. Then you're just fighting against what the actual soil wants to be. And, and, and I think you can design as designers, we should be able to design with the soils. So if we want, for instance, to have a very sparse kind of open uh, reel running through our, our, uh, our landscape design, then we could use a, a run of crushed concrete, very sterile, very hostile um, uh, substrate. Um, so in other words, you can dictate what you want to happen by what the soil is. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole implications of uh, the, the maintenance on the back of that. So the maintenance gets less because you're not fighting against what the thing wants to be. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole myriad of reasons. I mean, it, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a weed free material. So if you dig, if you use the sand that's underneath your topsoil as, a, as your planting medium, there's no weed seeds in it. So then you have the opportunity to direct sow. So if you direct so, one is the most, you know, I mean, the lowest use of carbon ever. No mm -hmm. pots, no compost, no transport, just a small pack of seed. Um, so you create an amazing landscape for very low amounts of money. But you can only really do that if you're sowing into a, a, a substrate that's weed free. Otherwise, the yeah. preparation to get that soil in a condition for it to, to direct so is quite difficult. Um, so there's, there's a big advantage in that and a big carbon advantage in that if mm -hmm. you can use that as a landscape technique. Um, and then of course, uh, if, you can, if you can start to, I don't know, I guess, I guess there's a kind of light bulb moment for me where, where, where we used to go and pick up all our construction materials. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the tip and the place itself, you know, there was really interesting stuff growing in all the piles of materials, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you can view a lot of the construction materials as potential landscape materials, 
Uh, and you, you, can, you can do all sorts of interesting things. And you can also get a lot of the landscaping done while the construction's happening, while the big machinery is there. Yeah, and so it's taking things off site and all that type of thing and all Absolutely. that extra movement. Absolutely. So, yeah, you've got to cart all this material off and then you've got to cart often topsoil back in. Um, so I think it's a conversation. I'm not saying you, mm. you know, we, we, we rip the topsoil off and we blanket it with rubble. We don't want mm. to do that. But we need to have a, a conversation embedded into the system into the project that says how can we use what we're creating, what materials are we creating, what waste are we creating from this project, what's already there, um, how can we use that in the landscape mm -hmm. rather than, okay, we've finished all the construction now, now we're going to come in with the landscape, we're going to put topsoil down and we're going to plant that, you know, which has been the default, I guess, up to now. Um, yeah, well, I think it's easy for people to kind of perceive that kind of is the wrong way of doing things, isn't it? Because you, when you think of the landscape, you think of, well, you know, going back, I would think of sort of woodland with your rich soils. You think woodland mm. would have very rich soil. You mm. think the whole landscape would be like that, this natural mm. sort of dark soil. Mm. But actually, that's, that's not the case at all. You know, many of our richest landscapes are very sandy. You know, heathlands grow on very sandy soils. Um, and it's, it's actually very diverse, what you find, you know, just beneath the surface. And I think people don't always realise that that's what a lot of these really rare habitats actually survive on, you know, no. um, like quarries and things, for example, where it's been very, very disturbed, they're often often very rich. Absolutely. I um, mean, I think that's the thing to remember is to remember that, you know, there's a big proportion of our triple SIs are on gravel pits, chalk pits, and in other words, places that we've gone in, completely trashed them and then just walked away. Mm -hmm. And we love those places as nature reserves now. But weirdly, and brownfield sites exactly the same. So there's, um, there's a brownfield site just down the road from us here in Canby Wick. Uh, third most important invertebrate site in the country, in the country, uh, you know, and that's just 70 years since an industrial area has been just left alone. So uh, what, what I found really confusing is that we know these places are incredible for wildlife and yet somehow we haven't thought why are they good for wildlife and can mm -hmm. we replicate, replicate that, that mm -hmm. in new landscapes? We've ignored it, even though we've loved the, the nature reserves and we, we, you know, we send ecologists there and everything's amazing. We don't seem to pick up on the things that, why is that? Why are they so good? And, uh, and of course, they're good because they're generally often low fertility, so they're mm -hmm. poor soils. They are um, incredibly, brownfield sites especially, are incredibly diverse with structure. And, uh, and uh, structure is, is, a, is a big deal. And I think, again, we've ignored that, but we could probably talk about that later. But so they're incredibly uh, uh, diverse with structural, stuff so they're mounds of materials nothing's flat mm -hmm. there's old bits of man-made material there might be an old brick wall a steel frame all sorts of of our detritus in effect and what that does that creates a incredibly complex landscape and the more complex the landscape the more complexity in the wildlife the mm -hmm. more diversity of wildlife it feels like a common sense thing yeah um, and it's and it's absolutely true so if you if you have a landscape that's completely flat and you put a, 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 a an even layer of topsoil over it it's going to be less diverse than mm. if you introduce lots of different yeah, lots of rocky out crops and yeah, exactly. sand banks and all that type of thing but i think yeah. i think the key to making this a success in new landscapes especially is we don't want to just fly tip although of course fly tips has been work done on fly tipping and it turns out they're quite good for biodiversity as well but we want to design these materials in a way that's cool and creative so we want to put those materials in and that structure in and but we want to have an aesthetic to it so mm -hmm. that the people are going to enjoy it and it's an arrogance probably not to do that so and you can do that i think you know what i mean you can do that uh, in a way that looks cool uh, but you're just using different types of materials you know yeah exactly i mean you mentioned earlier we were having a we quite often have a quick conversation before we start recording and yeah. you know we were having a conversation about how um, in ecology we'll quite often use um, squares of carpet or um, roofing felt or something like that and putting yeah. that down um, as a way of finding animals. Absolutely. And actually, and then you think, well, actually, why are we finding the animals there? It's because they love that, of course. that, that yeah. feature that's yeah, there. Yeah, of course. And so, I, I, I think that's, it, we've been using these techniques, haven't we, mm. for, year, for years and years, you know, and then we were also talking about um, um, shipwrecks and uh, mm. why, why, why are all the fish and why are all the activity, why is all the wildlife? where the ship's been sunk, you know, yeah. and around it is nothing, you know, mm -hmm. it's because of the complexity of the actual structure. And um, in fact, we, do, we, we sink ships specifically 
to do that now. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and why don't we think about that in our landscape? Why don't we, for instance, shopping trolleys in ponds, the most abhorrent thing that people can, you know, you can get a thousand volunteers to come and pull shopping trolleys out of ponds. You know, it, 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 it shocks us and we're upset about it, but it is incredibly good from a biodiversity point of view because it creates complexity and it creates structure, which is good within a pond. So we should take that and say that's good for biodiversity, but it's not good for us from an aesthetic. So we should yeah. design that into the landscape so we can have an, uh, you know, this, get something to do exactly the same thing as a, as a shopping trolley, but just look good. It could mm -hmm. be a piece of art, it could be anything, you know. Uh, and I think that, that whole conversation around, in effect, mimicking and learning from what we know is the best places for wildlife and then translating that into an aesthetic that people are going to under, not understand, that's, that's the wrong word, that people are going to, enjoy and mm. find exciting and joyous um, yeah. and I think something that becomes multifunctional yeah yeah and I, and I think that is that's the clever bit and it? it's mm. taking it's putting wildlife in a space that looks good yeah I mean obviously this doesn't have to apply to the whole landscape but especially the the area immediately around houses immediately mm. around visitor centers or nature reserve centers you know that area of highest impact car parks mm. pieces of infrastructure Anywhere where there's lots of people, I think we've got to be incredibly creative because we can fit wildlife in there, but it's got to be done so that people are going to enjoy being there and looking at it. Uh, and that can, you can, you can, we can do that. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. plenty of people around who are clever enough to make that happen. Yeah. Well, indeed. And I think also it's really important for people to understand that they can make, you know, rich habitats using waste materials. You know, you don't always have to go and buy the finest thing to, no. to, to put it into your garden. You can make things with a bit of rubble, with a bit of you know, leftover bricks and some yeah. felt and all that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And obviously, you know, we don't want to chuck this stuff all over the countryside. No. You know, that's not what we're saying. It, but it, there are ways to, to utilize these things that we otherwise would throw away mm. and actually create a much richer environment. Absolutely. For and, and you can, you can, often you need to think about how can you use, a how can you make the material acceptable? So for instance, we use a lot, we do a lot of work with gabion, Cages. Mm. So they're a really useful way of saying, here's a pile of rubble. If I just tipped it out on your on the ground, people would find it upsetting. Mm. Put it in a nice, neat, you know, uh, gabion cage. Stack the gabion cage nice and level. Spend some detailed time about getting that bit right, mm. and then the material inside suddenly becomes a really good-looking material, and people really like it. Yeah. And uh, and that's just a small example of you know how you can use. For instance, sand, um, so you know, we've done a lot of work here with using different sands, different local sands and different building sands, um, because not only are they good to grow plants in, but they're incredibly important for invertebrates to breed in. Uh, and um, uh, again, if you go to an urban uh, center and you, you tip up a pile of sand and say, here you go guys, that's really good for bees, leave that there, waste the time obviously, because mm. it's gonna be a brilliant sand pit for starters. So we've done work with trying to work uh, to, to produce, for instance, a planter where, we, where we've got the central uh, core of the planter that you can put your plants in and then out on the outside is a skin of perforated steel. Mm -hmm. And then in that space between those two, we pack sand that's really good for bees. Uh, these are solitary bees, obviously, not honey yeah. bees. And um, then the bees nest in through the holes in the perforated steel, the sand's kept in place everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So again, yeah. that's another case of, of, of looking at what habitat is important and then seeing how we can integrate that into everyday infrastructure. You know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think one of the things that's also missed is, with, with regards to that, is that we often think doing things for nature. You think of flowers, you think of trees. You don't necessarily think of where actually things are going to live. No. So you end up with a situation where you're putting in lots of flowers, um, you know, lots of trees, lots of grasses, whatever else it might be, but actually you're not creating places for things to nest. No. And where, as you mentioned earlier, with putting lots of topsoil down, you're, you can essentially be creating incredible habitat for bees, but you're removing the, the very environment where they actually nest and yeah, live. Absolutely. So you end up causing more harm than you may have done otherwise. Yeah, and of course you won't get, I mean, we've got, you know, I've, I've got a garden here that's been full of flowers for many years, yeah. um, but we, we, we wouldn't ever have had uh, we've got now about 20 species of bees and wasps that nest specifically in sand. Now, until we put piles of sand in this garden, it didn't matter how many flowers I had, we mm. would never have got those species in here. So we would never have increased the diversity. So by introducing these materials and that structural thing uh, that we've been talking about earlier, you pull in these species, you know, and I think it's that. You, so, and, and, and wildlife is incredibly quick at, at colonizing places if you do it right for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite an exciting thing. I mean, everything's a bit downbeat for obvious reasons. And then there's lots of bad stuff going on. But I think 
the potential of new landscapes to become important for wildlife is huge, but we really underplay that. We think mm. that we've got to have an ancient woodland to be, that that's where all the wildlife is. Well, it's not. It's in mm. brownfield sites. It's in places that are complex. And we can do that in a new landscape, can't we? You know, mm. Exactly, yeah, Because definitely. we've got a chance to do it from scratch. Yeah. Um, so I think that we've really underplayed and 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 we can and and these structural elements can be great looking parts of the design you know mm. what i mean no, so well it can make know. places unique as well you know yeah. if you're using soils that are found in that area they're not found in other areas no. you know they're unique to that space no um, and the ecology is unique to that space so you, yeah. you create much a much better sense of character yeah. and local distinctiveness too and you can use you know if you if, you know for instance if you're looking at some verticals for instance as part of your design for, mm. you know as a design tool i mean you know Let's have a let's have a, a vertical. You know, you can use some beautiful oak, um, but you can just drill holes from three eight, three to eight millimeters in your beautiful oak post, and then that becomes a habitat for bees. It's still a vertical, it's still a beautiful design element, but it's functioning on a, on a, on a, on a uh, you know an extra scale. And the same with standing dead timber. We've been doing a lot of work recently with taking um, reasonable sized coppice timbers that are that are being um, uh, cut down and coppiced. We take them out bring them into a landscape, dig a hole, stick them in the ground, put them precisely upright, take care where you're putting them, mm. piece of standing dead. Very, very rare within new landscapes. In fact, probably exactly. never in new yeah. landscapes, but incredibly important for so many, um, uh, so much of our wildlife. And of course, because you're putting in that standing dead from scratch, you can predict how long that's gonna last, how long mm. it's gonna take to rot. It's, obviously, there's a whole risk aversion to leaving standing uh, dead timber, isn't there? From the because you, there it's is, unpredictable. But, maybe that is, but we're trying to do it more and more on projects. So now we make a rule of basically, if trees have got to come out um, for whatever reason, they might be damp, they might be da dangerous, they might be yeah. dying, uh, they might just need to be in, they might just be in completely the wrong place, mm. uh, which which happens on developments. You know, trees do have to come down sometimes. Um, but we try and make it so if they are being removed, we're building habitat piles from them. Mm. Um, Sometimes they'll be chipped and left in a pile of mm. chips, you know, something yeah. again a bit different. But a lot of the time what we're trying to do is say um, within our design statements and things and on our plans that they're to be made safe by the arboriculturalist to a height that the best height they yeah. can. Yeah. Um, and then they're left. Yeah. And then we might plant climbers or something underneath them and maybe new yeah. trees behind them. So they become a little bit of a landscape feature. Yeah. And OK, they're going to rot down and they might look a bit gangly for a few years. Yeah, but, but they've got a quite a, yeah, yeah, but they're very low risk. Yeah. Um, and they've got huge potential yeah. biodiversity value. And yeah. also they're different. You don't see them in the landscape very no. often, no. you know, and actually they become, can become a real focal point of a garden. Yeah, yeah, and you'll yeah, get yeah. woodpeckers on them yeah. And, yeah. and all this yeah. kind of thing. Well, those things should be built, for instance, you know, I, I think we should have um, pieces of standing dead in a new car park. We should have pieces, we should have this sort of infrastructure. We should have an acceptance now that we need this stuff and we should kick against that kind of standard planting regime in the everyday infrastructure stuff. I, think, I mean, that's what I find really fascinating is that just kind of juxtaposition of new hard infrastructure that we have to have, whether it be a car park, whether it be a cycle path, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and uh, how can we how can we integrate and how can we squeeze habitat into that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, and of course, the other thing about those sort of places uh, now is that they are the places where everyone goes. So, you know, what's the first, you know, you, we've, the work we've been doing on the car park up the road at the visitor center. I mean, everyone has to go in the car park first. That's the first impression that you're going to make uh, for your um, building and for your nature reserve or whatever mm -hmm. it happens to be is the car park. So there's a great place to actually inform people and create and, and, and get creative with it and, and show them something that they might be able to take back into their own home um, uh, and create, obviously, biodiversity for the space itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we, we can't ignore, I think because green space is never coming back. So yeah. we, don't ever, we don't ever have, a, a, you know, supermarkets never get knocked down and, and parks put back. That doesn't ever happen. So the only place actually we've got to increase biodiversity is on the back of development, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it is. Yeah, it, that, that's the place. Really that's is. all we're it left is. with, aren't we? So if we don't make an incredibly good job of that, then we are letting the thing down. And, they are, um, and it, it, a lot of it comes back to policy and how these things are going to be, you know, pushed through. Like one one city that I think's got it got it quite right. It's a bit a bit authoritarian, but I think it's a good move. Is Singapore? You know, they have a policy where some parts of the city are essentially owned by the government. And um, after 100 years, say, they can redo what they want with that part of the city. So they allows them to regenerate and recycle parts of the city quite efficiently to meet the new 
because they know things are going to change in mm. 100 years. And it's mm. how do they meet that and how do they do that in a structured right, right. way? Now, obviously, that's a very specific example and they're very very unique because they're very very small island um you know they're very very densely populated so they've got to be very innovative but um that's how they've come across trying mm. to tackle mm. um that challenge mm. of, of putting things back but you're completely right that's that's not going to happen here no. um so we've got to get things right the first time we do it and and i think we've also got to get in our heads that we've got to somehow shift the emphasis from spending all our money on piece on the infrastructure and or the building and and not not there's no emphasis on the landscape you know i mean most of the projects we deal with you know there's millions spent on a building and then you get tacked on in the end to try and create a landscape with with a tiny budget and and i think that yeah. we've got to somehow get that headspace sorted as well and, and change that emphasis um because uh, otherwise um, you know, these places are going to be sterile places, you know, and, and, exactly. and they are our only hope, they are our only, our only, our only place, you know. Uh, and I think also, if you make, say, something as mundane, let's say, as a car park somewhere, exciting to go, you know, mm -hmm. if a car park becomes the place you'd like to go to see the car park, you know, that's what these, that's the, that, I think that's the, that's the level of, of importance we should put on the everyday, you know, because... Mm -hmm. These, well, it's your first impression. Yeah. yeah of the you whole know, thing. I mean, like we, we do work with, with these structures like bin shelters, for instance, mm. where you put your Euro bins, you know, I mean, mm. the most disgusting, smelly places, and obviously always associated with a place you don't want to go. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're building them with habitat on the side, we're putting green roofs on, and we're making them, you know, I'm not going to say where people want to rush there and spend their day there, but they certainly don't mind going and chucking their, their, their rubbish in there, hopefully, yeah. because there's a lot going on and there's interpretation on it. Mm -hmm. And again, these are places that people have to go to. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get engaged with the public and you want to get people on side, they're the places to actually start doing this stuff, I think, rather than in the remote corner of a nature reserve. Yeah. You know, because most people don't go there, you know, and the rest of us are living, you know, in, in close up to houses, close up to in infrastructure. Supermarket car parks are probably a great, great place to do something with, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it's very difficult. Retrofitting is much more difficult. I think mm -hmm. we, we've, got to, we've got to embed this. We've got to have that pause in the conversation of planning at, uh, or ever, whatever development and say, look, how can we best make use of this space from a biodiversity point of view and from a people point of view, I guess. Um, and I don't think at the moment that doesn't seem to be happening. Um, no, it, seems, it does seem very slow for things to, yeah. to, to take place. I mean, things are, things are getting stricter and there's a lot more pressure being put on um, by councils and to councils and developers are getting, you know, are starting to be clued into it. Because a lot of these things, you know, if they're done from the beginning, they can actually save money. Yeah. You know, um, if they, you know, if, again, with your car park example, you know, if you can use waste material that's already on site, yeah. that's, a, that's an immediate cost saving. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's not, and then you end up with a better product at the end and something that's more interesting and better for ecology too. So there's a lot of opportunity to, to improve things. It's just, I think a lot of the time people aren't aware of it or they don't think of it. No. Um, and things can be so disassociated, you know, um, everyone's so siloed. It can be, can be very difficult yeah. for some of those well, decisions to actually need... work their way through. Yeah, I agree. And that's why you need the system to force that to happen, yeah, exactly, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, I think that's the problem. It's the same with, with when we were um, uh, uh, looking after uh, social housing, for instance. The system is the maintenance contract. People work to a maintenance contract. So if you're caring for a social housing estate, um, what you're given is a contract mm -hmm. and unless you're very keen you know or unless you, you've got a, a certain personal interest you're going to stick to what that contract is now if that contract is bland and shit which most of them are you, that's going to just continue to happen so we've got to change that system you know mm -hmm. that contract should be about people it should be about joy it should be about biodiversity there should be an emphasis on those things in a contract about green space because most contracts up until relatively recently didn't even talk about the people that live there they just exactly, talked about yeah. how many times you was cutting the grass and, and uh, what percentage of weed cover you had. You know, and, and there was nothing that connected them, the, the, the actual job, to the people. Because at the end of the day, that, all the job is, is to make the place better for the people to live, that, that are mm. living there, isn't that? Isn't Indeed. that the job, I guess? You know? Yeah, it is. But the trouble is, I think often things are just passed down or someone else, the next person will kind of deal with that. You know, and management's a key example. It's kind of like, well, we'll come in and we'll design the space, but someone else has got to deal with it. Our, yeah. You know, it's not our problem yeah, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the question is, how do, how do you tackle that? And I think one of the areas where it's become quite apparent is a lot of the new green buildings where they're covered in trees and plants mm. and, and green roofs and all that type of thing. Um, 
And a balcony is a really good example because you might get one of these new buildings that's covered in trees and planting and climbers. So when you look at it, it's beautiful, all covered in green. But actually, if those balconies are owned by the residents, there's a really high chance they'll rip some of that out to put their bike there. And all of a sudden you end up with a patchwork of, you know, some of the green's gone and things mm. are being removed mm. and it slowly de declines. Um, but a lot of companies probably don't want the hassle of having to look after that um, because it's someone's balcony. People want to own their balcony, but actually that conversation potentially needs to change. And that balcony needs to be owned and managed, or at least that feature of mm. it needs to be owned and managed by a management company to maintain the objectives of the of the development. And that's what's starting to happen in some of these really big um, yeah. these really big building projects. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's going to happen. It, it will to generally tend to happen in, in, in buildings that obviously are, have the, the finance and the, uh, you know, I don't know, the system that can allow that level of commitment mm. to, to maintenance. Uh, you know, whether or not that could be integrated into public housing or not is, is I don't know, I'm not sure. I mean, I know certainly the uh, uh, Bosco Vertical, which obviously- Well, that's the one, one that does this management. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So th th they're high-end clients that are going yeah. into that space. So there's the budget there to, to this to be looked after. And also they're clients that probably would be happy for the, the trees to be maintained nicely mm -hmm. on the balcony. I don't know, there's not, the, you know, maybe the, the, the priorities, I don't know. It just feels like it'd be great if we could somehow either relate, either put that or finance it in some way so that the, the, the social housing block has that level of maintenance. Well, they sh yeah, there's, I mean, that they should. Great. And I think that, yeah. you know, I hope that could, or I think sometimes if you've, if you've got a limited budget, you might have to look away from balconies and vertical features that are pretty high to maintain yeah. and pretty costly to maintain Very and costly. say, how can we spend probably three quarters of that money on the ground and make as, as good a job and if not probably a more important job. Do you know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a place for the vertical stuff and it looks great and it sends a message, but there's, a, there's quite a cost in, to, to keeping that as it is. There's a huge cost, yeah. Um, so I think sometimes, and I, th I think it sometimes happens with um, organizations where they, they're, they're green because they've spent a lot of money on maybe a big green wall outside their headquarters, you know? And, and for that amount of money and for that amount of maintenance, probably they could have created a lot more biodiversity in, on, the, on the ground, Definitely, around yeah. the building. So I think we've got to be careful there's not- Well, there's a lot of statement certain, pieces, yeah, shall we say, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know there's a place for that, but I think yeah. certainly with public money, like with councils, and I've seen it happen with councils who've got wrapped into the, the green wall thing and want to make that statement. I think sometimes, you know, uh, is that the right place? And could you could you spend that money in the landscape around? The yeah, well, the thing that I often wonder about is green. I've, I've met several people that have been calling green infrastructure public health infrastructure, yeah. and I wonder if actually some you know public health money should be spent on. I mean, there's not much public health money well, going around either. And there needs no, to be more there. But there's plenty but, of um, proof that that is. The but there's case, a huge, well, there's a monumental proof, yeah. and and yeah. It's, the amount of the return on investment is incredible. Wow, exactly. So um, you know there really should be a case made there as well, and actually these things should be maintained for that reason. And I think. I think we were talking about again talking about this earlier is, is that you know if we spent a, we could spend such a small amount of money and invest it in in the in how caring for green spaces not having to build more stuff mm. you don't have to build more infrastructure a lot of the time you just need to look after what's already there in a lot in a lot better way and yeah. be there so we found with with residents that, that people would would much rather have more gardeners on the ground caring more carefully for what was there. And it doesn't have to be an amazingly designed place. It just has to be a bit flowery, just a bit more, a bit nicer. And not only do, do gardeners do that for a space, but they also are people that, that, you, that the, the residents can then connect with and chat to. And there's a human connection there and a human yeah. interaction. That's worth money. So the maintenance guys, you know, can become part of the health of the place. Obviously. Definitely. You well, know. it becomes a hub for community, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and they become the people that know everything and know everyone. And exactly. they become a really important caregiver exactly. in some ways. And a lot of evidence around care homes um, and people suffering with things like dementia that is that normality is one of the most important things. Yeah. You know, seeing people every day collecting your bins exactly. or putting the washing out or whatever exactly. can have huge benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and having that in the communities, you know, vital. I, I think so. And of course, what standard maintenance contracts don't virtually, they virtually don't allow you to take off ear protection. So if you mm. look at a standard maintenance contract, you're hedge trimming, you're cutting grass or you're poisoning weeds. That's, that's often, you know, in, in the basic contracts have dumbed down to that. Mm. So we need to have designed into the, we need to have a contract that allows you to take the ear protection off and do some hand weeding and just do some, just care. 
Mm. Uh, and then you can talk to people. You can't talk yeah. to people on most. I mean, well, the poor guys who have to drive around estates on mowers, they never get a chance to talk to anyone. That's it. You know, so... It, I mean, it, I, I used to do a lot of gardening when I finished school. It was kind of my first business, really, doing bits of gardening for people. And, uh, you know, I used to, there was a few people I did sort of a couple of hours a week for. Yeah. And I probably spent at least half the time just chatting exactly. to them over a cup of tea, actually. Exactly. There was very little gardening that really no. went on, really, you know. No. Um, and it no. was just, you know, sometimes you might be the only person they see that week. And it becomes a really important connection. Uh, and, and it's going to become more important as our population ages. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. they are, you know, these people have a huge opportunity to be caregivers and support people in their community. They do. And I think, uh, I think it's, people just love seeing people caring for mm. a place. That's what, they, they, there's a joy in that. I mean, there's a, there's a guy, for instance, in London that I follow on, on, uh, on, on social media. He, he, he gardens the tree pits, you know, in the street. And, uh, you know, he, he doesn't spend... I don't suppose he spends hours working out the planting plan. He gets given plants, the plants go in. It's just those pockets of not only it's not just the colour uh, and 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 the fact that he's he's you know he's worked on that it's it's just the the care that someone's given mm. to your street you know it's yeah. outside your house and uh, people really love that and that doesn't cost much no you know what I mean you really haven't got a, if if we could shift some of the infrastructure money into giving it to people to care for places. I think that would really transform a place. It doesn't have to be that sophisticated, mm -hmm. I think. Exactly, um, and it's, so it's making that, that decision really, isn't it? It's shifting away from stuff. It is. And more and more shiny or green yeah. stuff to actually things that really it make is. a much bigger difference. It is, and, and I think we, we, somehow societies, we've, just, we're mis we've, we've excluded that somehow, haven't we? We've, we've, we've yeah. taken the value of that away. We just don't, we don't value people's time now mm. so much, you know? Um, you know, and I know, you know, the budgets are tight, but when mm. we were in, uh, looking after the estate in, in Hackney, I mean, we could always get money to buy stuff and build stuff, mm -hmm. always. So there was money there, yeah. but we weren't allowed to have that money to give to a local gardener to look after a place. Mm. We weren't allowed to do that. Yeah. It's so, ridiculous. So what was the project you were involved with in Hackney? So what was that doing? Well, it was, a, it was uh, we did a bit of work for a, uh, an estate called Clapton Park Estate in uh, Hackney uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, we got on well with a resident group. And when we'd finished the job, the maintenance contract came up. So um, they asked us whether we'd like to just quote mm -hmm. for the maintenance contract. I mean, we'd never done maintenance before. We'd always done design and build. And, um, but I was getting a bit fed up with design and build because it's basically construction, then you put a few plants in, then you, then you start digging holes again. It was, you know, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm a plant person. So, mm -hmm. it was, it, it, so I thought, well, you know, we'll give it a go. So we wandered around the estate, you know, naively trying to work out how long it was going to take <laughs> us to cut this bit of grass, cut that bit of grass. Anyway, we, we, put, we put the contract, uh, we put the quote in and, and we, we won the contract. So, and then once, once you were there, first of all, it's a, it's a serious privilege to actually look after public space. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I'd say. It's an amazing privilege to be able to look after places that people, a lot of people see. And then once you're in there, you think, well, you know, I'm not going to just spray that edge of a railing three times a year and for the weeds, I'm going to maybe sow some flowers in there and, or, you know, here's some, uh, Zainab, my Turkish resident, and I know she's desperate to grow food and uh, we've got a crappy bit of grass down underneath where her flat is that does nothing apart from us push a mower up and down it. So we'll mm. give her a plot to grow food. So I think that's the other thing about maintenance is because you're there regularly, you can actually have much more chance of understanding what people want and you mm. can change. You can just tweak what you do slightly to improve the place. Mm -hmm. That's all you're doing a lot of the time. You know, you're just, okay, we're not going to mow that eight foot, bit, eight foot square piece of ground. We're going to give that to Zainab to grow her food in. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. How much does that cost? Virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that's what we found. We, we, we realized, and, and, the, and, and, the, and then of course, as the years went on, we just kept tweaking things and changing things, hopefully for what people wanted. Uh, and I suppose, Ultimately, the end of all that meant that one is that it was wonderful was that the, the residents changed the name of the estate to the Poppy Estate, mm -hmm. which, which was on the back of the flowers that we'd originally sown along the railings instead of mm -hmm. spraying them with herbicide constantly, which was wonderful and lovely. Uh, and two was they, they asked us to write the contract when we left, which we did in 2020, they asked us to write the contract for the new to go out to tender. Mm -hmm. So that meant, because of course, like we've just been saying, unless you change that system, mm -hmm. I'll disappear or the keen person disappears and it defaults back. 
you've yeah. got to change the system that says the next guy, whether he wants to or not, he's got to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's hopefully um, what happened. And I think that's the only way we're going to change things on any scale. Otherwise, yeah. I'm just piddling around in my garden here and I'm doing one housing estate. What well, good's that? And I mean, not to say there's not, there's loads of people doing good stuff, but it's on a smaller scale. Yeah. If we don't change the system, we can't get it to change on any Well, it's any those scale. small things that really matter. You know, and when you start looking at a lot of other systems, like if we look at crime and things like that, a lot of evidence is, is showing that that's due to decline of communities, you know, and community yeah. policing, all that type yeah. of thing. A lot of things have to go back to communities and on that smaller scale. Yeah. There's changes needed on a big scale to lead to that, like we discussed, yeah. you know, policies yeah, and things yeah, need yeah, to change, yeah. and there needs to be much more support yeah, yeah. for it. But yeah. the, you know, the, the benefits are manifest, oh, there's so yeah. many. And if people, if, if places look like they're cared for, they don't get smashed up. Mm. They don't get smashed up, people are happier, Everything, you have a sense of ownership. Everything, everything yeah. makes sense. I mean, we had it with the, the with the signs on our estate. We had signs, old signs when you went, you know, you got on when you went onto the estate, and they said something like, "Sad, like you are now entering Clapton Park Estate." As it, it felt like some sort of uh, ghetto. Mm. You know, I mean, what kind of a statement is that? You know mm. what I mean? And of course, that was covered in tags and graffiti because it just said nothing, did nothing, yeah. had no welcoming feeling to it at mm. all. So we, we replaced the sign with, a, with a, a colourful sign, with a map showing where all the green spaces were, with a big welcome to Clapton Park Estate, great mm. to have you here, that kind of, mm. you know, no tags, no graffiti. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not saying it's a cure-all and it's never perfect, obviously, but if you don't give people the respect of actually, you know, saying to them, talking to people in some sort of a normal way, then why the hell should they care? Uh, and it's the same as all the signs you got slapped up around houses and states like no ball games, no fouling, all those pointless, pointless signs because they're Which just everyone ignores anyway. They're just shouty signs, yeah. and they why 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 don't you say, look, you know, kids play on this space. It's quite important. It'd be great if you could keep your dogs off because you know hmm. people are using this space. There, there you go. Not going to ever be perfect, but it's definitely going to be work, work better than slapping one of those signs. Up. So we took them all off because hmm. they're a pointless thing. Um, so I guess it, it's, it, I mean, I think we're talking about more, we're talking more about people now than we are yeah. about landscape, but I think that's the point, isn't it? Yeah, no, it I is. Think that's, but it's, 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 it's a thing that's often missed. Yeah. You, often, you, often, you can come in easily and design these spaces, but it's very easy to forget who you're designing or managing yeah. them for. Yeah. You're managing them for people yeah. and wildlife. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and also from your point of view as, mm. a, as a designer, you know, it, unless that, D uh, decent cared for maintenance is in place, your scheme doesn't work, does it? Yeah, you know, exactly, so yeah. It's, you have a vested interest as well, mm. don't you? And we all have a vested interest to make those schemes work. Whereas most of the time, there's a big wad of money spent on the scheme itself, uh, and then there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a moment where the mayor comes out and there's a stainless steel spade moment and they take a pick, everyone disappears, and then you have a, you know, you have a geezer on £10 an hour with a strimmer. Mm. And then that, that, that's, that might be an exaggeration, but that's what happens time yeah. and time again. In and principle, yeah. It, we, we, we don't put the emphasis on anything in regards to medium or long-term mm. uh, thought. Um, so that would be great. If we, could, if we could shift some emphasis onto paying more people to care for a place mm -hmm. instead of always about infrastructure, that would be really good, I think. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I hope you've enjoyed the episode so far. Here's a quick message from one of our sponsors. Make sustainability a priority throughout the design process with a suite of tools built specifically for landscape architecture and design. Vectorworks gives you the freedom to follow your imagination wherever it may lead. With remarkably flexible software that integrates BIM for landscape and GIS workflows, sketch, model, and document in a single tool with the world's most design-centric BIM solution. Discover Vectorworks landmark and design without limits. Visit vectorworks.net to learn more. And then we've messed around with um, uh, kind of, in effect, urban, well, I think of this is like urban dungeness, like urban shingle, really, which is just crushed brick and concrete. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that because it's all made for the building industry, you can, mm. you, they've, you, you've got that huge choice of refinement of what size of material, mm. whether it comes with uh, fines, whether it doesn't come with fines. So, you, you know, as a landscape, potential you've got a huge choice mm -hmm. so we're just trialing some plants on this with um uh, this is like just 20 mil crushed um without any fines and uh, 
certainly we're finding that a lot of the, 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 the plants and a lot of plants that prefer that sort of drainage and that are more, more than happy in that. Same as though they'd be if it was natural gravel, I'd guess, or natural shingle, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's it. So, yeah, so you're using this site as a bit of an experiment, really, to try lots of different techniques out and see kind of what works? Yeah, because you never, you just, a lot of the time you can't really predict it. You can't yeah. predict it. So, um, and also we're, we're trialing all the different sands to see what sands work as an invertebrate habitat, what sands work as a, a bee nesting habitat. So this is one patch of sand. This is uh, the, what was the glacial outwash, the, the, like the, there was a line of glacial outwash in the A13 road mm -hmm. winding scheme, because all this, all this sand has come from the road winding, which is about a mile from here. Mm -hmm. um, and the good thing about that is, of course, that the, the, the local uh, invertebrates are used to nesting in this exact sand. So yeah. we're just moving that, which is obviously a really ideal way. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to uh, um, prove, obviously, is that invertebrates from, from a mile away will make the trip to find this, <laughs> basically, a small clump of sand. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, bearing in mind, we're on heavy clay here, so we, we never had any of these species in our garden because there was nowhere for them to nest. Uh, um, and we've got about 15 to 20 species now that have made that jump from where the sand is, which is about a mile away, into this just on the back of a few piles of sand. Yeah. So that's quite, I don't know, it does, that feels you know, really a hopeful thing that we can create well, it just, a Yeah, it shows that if you can create it, they'll come and, and they'll move around. And yeah. then you get your little islands, don't you? So they can move between the And then they can jump from easily. here, hopefully, to yeah. somewhere else. Um, exactly. And um, we're hoping that we've just, we've just completed a, a car park scheme a mile and a half up the road, and I've mm. just finished that with the same sand. Mm. So we're really hoping that we might get that jump to that and then mm. we could really start to prove that this is happening, you know. Yeah. Um, and of course, because we've got a bit of space here to try things, we can see, so the glacial outwash is got, has got an element of clay in it uh, and, uh, and there's, there's certain species of bees that really like nested in that. And then there's other sand from the A13 that's just pure thanet, which is, is much finer without any stone in and there's species of bee that sort of prefer that. So mm -hmm. um, we've got this kind of trial thing going on uh, of not only checking the sand out for what grows in it, but checking it out for what actually would, is happy to nest in it, which is the yeah. two kind of important biodiversity elements, I guess. So you mentioned this is from the road widening scheme. Yeah. So have they not used this in the road widening scheme themselves then, or was it something that was sort of missed out? Or is this one well, of those topsoil Yeah, well, what happened issues? was, I mean, I, I obviously, because I drive down that road a lot, I saw the whole thing unfolding. So once they started to widen the road, they essentially took away all the habitat that was there, obviously, they, so that all went. Uh, and then they scraped the embankment back, regraded the embankment and exposed this most beautiful sandbank, south facing sandbank. Now, um, where we live here, we're, we, we've got the Thames terraces down to the river, which are, you know, like the gold standard for invertebrate habitat. You know, they, they, everyone drools over them, the council bigs them up. They are essentially just south facing gravelly sandy banks facing mm -hmm. south. That's all they are, right? Yeah. Well, we, they just created a mile of exactly that. Yeah. And then, and we, despite all our campaigning, topsoil gets dumped over the whole lot. <laughs> so once that topsoil layer goes straight over the whole lot, that's it. Mm. The breeding space disappears. So the potential yeah. of that habitat, and they know how good it is. It's yeah. only a mile, you know, it's only a little bit down the road. All the invertebrates from there would have jumped straight to that new motorway uh, embankment. It yeah. really would. Yeah. I'm not saying maybe, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's not all like that, but certainly there should have been sections of that embankment that most definitely should have been left to sand. Yeah. And it never it's happened. It's for diversity, is not, if nothing else, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, the good news is, and the, the very exciting news is, that the highways have now flipped. Yeah. So highways now, there's a policy that uh, a guy called Ben Hewlett has um, uh, um, proposed and, and has now gone through that does say you shouldn't put topsoil back on new embankments unless there's a really good reason to do so. So, Brilliant. so that as a default now, you shouldn't have topsoil, which, which is a, a total game changer for when you think that's Highways England. Yeah, um, but also high, Highways England have also in the new um, national planning policy framework, they've now said that trees have to be street lined as well. So there's, there's a lot mm -hmm. changing in highways because often the, well actually we were talking about it on a podcast we recorded yesterday, um, that actually they should be doing a lot more. And it seems that all of a sudden they have, as you say, they've made that flip. Yeah. And actually it's gonna have a huge impact on how we design not only the countryside, but yeah. cities as well. Yeah, you know? yeah, and of course, hi what are highways? They're linear connections to everywhere, yeah. aren't they? They are exactly. one of the most important places. So if we can get it, it, that, that, that one policy in, in, in theory should be an incredible game changer. Oh, it will be, yeah. And then of course, 
that also, it's not just the biodiversity potential, it's also the carbon use. So if, we, mm. if, if you've got very low fertility embankments, and I know the guy called uh, Phil Sterling, who you, I don't know whether you've ever met Phil, but anyway, amazing guy. And he, he 10 years ago, managed to convince um, Dorset Council to leave chalk embankments on the Weymouth Relief Road. So this was just a, a relief road that was put in, new embankments created, mm -hmm. all chalk, and there was going to go, topsoil was going to go straight back on. He managed to stop and put in, well, they still insisted on putting a little bit, but he managed to stop and put most of it on. And so they've got, he's got a 10 year record of this place now. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how many thousands of orchid spikes, 30 species of butterfly, going to become one of the most important places within 10 years. Yeah. And also most importantly, zero maintenance. So no yeah. grass cutting, no carbon use, no fuel use. Yeah. So, there's a there's a great case there um, that's sort of proven it with chalk, and that will apply to sand. It will apply mm. to it could it would apply to clay embankments, you know. I mean, I think it's it's uh, it's a it's a vast improvement, and uh, and it's great that highways are doing that. It is. No, so it's good to see. so um, so the, yeah. So this is all all these sands basically are waste from the road widening, and mm. we we knew the haulier, and um, he we basically bought them back off him. Not very much money, obviously, because they're not. They're not, um, you know, valuable items. Uh, and then we thought, well, how can we, uh, how can we get this habitat maybe into an urban space? Because it's a pile of sand, you know, you can't just dump piles of sand in the middle of the streets. It doesn't work, obviously. Um, so we tried this sort of prototype idea where we, uh, we uh, put a, a, a tube in the center that, we, that you can plant with flowers. I mean, I, we've put native stuff in there, but obviously you could put petunias and your geraniums, whatever you wanted to do in the middle there. And then we wrapped it in perforated steel, and this is just standard screening, perforated biting, mm -hmm. um, eight before sheets. Cut it down the middle, just connect it, uh, bolt it together, and it springs out into a, a circle. And then we packed this with the A13 sand, and then the bees nest in through the holes and also nest on the surface. So um, we've, we, then we've trialed this in, in the garden for um, about four or five years. Uh, and, and now we've made it into a product which we can have a look at maybe a bit later. Yeah, sounds good. good. Yeah, I mean, you've seen it with some other things that we'll probably come around to later. Some of the poles and things like that as well with yeah, sand yeah. and things yeah, in. Yeah, 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 the bee posts as well and the, and the, and the sand um, columns as well. That's it. But this, this is the thing, isn't it? In an urban environment, it doesn't have to be, as you say, piles of sand or it can be much more intricate kind of designs yeah. and shapes. But as long as those materials and things are there and the opportunity yeah. for things is Absolutely. there. Absolutely. That's think... what's important. It, it, it is kind of, it is pretty cool that you, if, you, if you actually get the materials and get the, 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 the structure in, then mm. stuff will arrive. Yeah. And we can get them into the cities, but we just got to be creative and we about how we design it. That's exactly, so it looks here. good, exactly. <clears throat> that's the, it, that's it's the a smart, it's the relationship between nature and people, isn't yeah. it? And how, yeah, and places, people, place and nature. Yeah. And, how and, it all works and, together. And I, 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 I really think it's a, an arrogance to, put, to expect people to, to maybe to not have an aesthetic mm -hmm. around habitat. Oh, habitat no, agree, can yeah. have an aesthetic and it needs to, I think, in an, in an environment uh, close to people. But it breeds innovation as well. The it more does. innovative yeah, we can it, be with these things, does. the better. Yeah. And people understand yeah. it and appreciate it more. As you said, if yeah. you can integrate it with art, whatever else it may Absolutely. be, it has so many more benefits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we were talking earlier about um, uh, standing dead and things. And so this is, this is um, uh, just a piece of hornbeam, for instance. And, if, and this has just got a few holes drilled in it. Uh, and you just stuck, stick a few holes in it and then it becomes a, a habitat uh, as well as a piece of standing dead. And, uh, and a useful use, again, trying to use stuff that you're creating this in the coppicing process anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so any, any waste that you create by the work you do is not, it's just stopping and thinking, what can we do with that? Is it a place we can put it? Can we use it within the landscape that we've, exactly. used, we've, we've maintained? Yeah, and it's all those small things that have that, you know, add up for carbon saving, as you say, you know, why yeah. take trees away and bring new ones in if you can use Absolutely. what's already there? Uh, well, I remember on the housing estate, the, the first, one of the first times we uh, had some tree work done and I remember the guys obviously were taking the logs, taking the chip, taking it away. And it was, mm. they didn't want to do that. It was yeah. a pain in the neck to them. And oh, we managed yeah. to just stop that process because you can always use the chip and you can always stack the logs from mm -hmm. any tree work on a certainly on a big housing estate you can you know what I mean? it's yeah. easy well i mean the, the, the crazy thing is now we design those you know we design those features in yeah so there's a yeah. you know, even if it's a small area you know we're doing a small playground at the moment but we're making sure there's piles of rubble we're making sure there's um various structures with rubble and um not so much sand um but rubble in maybe some you know like your standard sort of mm. bug hotel but mm. more of 
um, habitat panels yeah. or, or whatever yeah. else it may yeah. be, yeah. 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 Uh, which we've spoken to you about yeah. before. Um, you know, and piles of dead wood and big logs and things, you know, just to be a feature, yeah. a feature amongst the planting, because yeah. it's more interesting yeah. than just a bunch of plants, you know. And it's doing, it's doing more than one thing as well. It's probably exactly. be, it probably becomes a, uh, something the kids love to play on and Indeed, it becomes yeah. a habitat. So it's, it's that classic case of getting it to be a multifunctional thing, I think. Space is way too precious, isn't it, to, 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 mm -hmm. to have infrastructure without some thought about where we can fit a niche for wildlife in. It's, it's, yeah, too, it's too important now. And it it's, is, it's, it is. With, with the way we and are. it's that understanding that people need that these things have a function. They're not just there because we've been lazy and left a load of stuff there. They're there to serve a purpose. Absolutely. And then people get more interested in it, especially kids. Like, oh, really? There's bees in here? God. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, you know, yeah, where yeah, are they? You know, that yeah, type yeah, of thing. And yeah, yeah. I, I think it's all... It, but there has to be a, a certain uh, a process and a creative process of, of, of getting the design right for that. Definitely, I think yeah. that's where the skill is involved in, 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 in doing that. Because yeah. uh, uh, once, you, once you get the design right and the aesthetic right, then you get the public on your side for sure. You do, yeah, you definitely, know. definitely. Very important. So, um, so we were talking earlier about um, construction waste and, and how we might reuse that in the landscape. And yeah. um, this, this, this kind of swale that runs down the garden here, this is the bit that we did first. And this has been really useful about having the space where I live because mm. this is 18 years old. So 18 years ago, we scraped off the topsoil and we uh, basically we just dumped, uh, I think it was about four or five, eight wheelers of demolition rubble of some sort, you know what I mean? Um, and at that time, we didn't really distinguish between what material it was. So it was mm -hmm. a kind of a mixed bag of, of stuff. So there has been a variation in, in the vegetation depending on what sort of lorry load came. Um, but what's really interesting about this is 18 years on with very, very little maintenance. The only maintenance I have to do on this now, or I'm starting to have to do, is probably pull out tree seedlings that are starting to come in. Mm -hmm. um, but this has essentially looked after itself and is still really useful and really important. And it's become like a, it's got all the classic kind of chalk downland um, plants in here because it's got because it's obviously got a concrete base so it's going to be an alkaline um, uh, substrate yeah so we've got a ladies bed straw and we've got marjoram and we've got wild so, so is this all just naturally colonized no we seeded, you this. seeded it no yeah. we did seed this and i think that's a, again you, you know you, you can't really expect the plants you want to come in and, and it's really good to seed initially because once you get the plants that should be there established, then, they, then it's more difficult for other species to start Yeah, to definitely, dominate. otherwise so, you just end up being colonised by... Yeah, it'll be all something. ruderal weeds, basically, yeah. for sure. Which is not a bad thing, but you see there's some ruderals in there, but, but there's, a, there's enough of, them, of the, uh, the ground being taken up by the quite important uh, downland yeah. stuff. Um, so so I think this is quite good, to, just to prove that after 18 years, this is still functioning pretty yeah. well and still has an aesthetic and is still, uh, it, despite being, you know, very low maintenance. I mean, you could make this look, um, you know, fancier and, and, uh, and more of an aesthetic if you gardened it a bit. Mm. But, you know, we, don't have, we didn't, haven't had the time certainly to do that. So. But it's such an effect, you know, but you can clearly see this is, you know, an attractive wildflower mix, essentially. Yeah. You know, an and, awful and, lot of wildflowers and, in here. And I guess you just contrast it with a bit of gr cut grass, don't you, or a path yeah, or yeah. something formal. And it becomes between... clear that, that, that it is something. Yeah. It's not just a bunch of weeds yeah. that have just grown up. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, the, that's obviously the key to all this. And, and the other thing as well, the, the amount of butterflies and bees flying around really is quite incredible. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I because because we're here all the time, we well, I sometimes forget yeah. that, and that is something. To be fair, people do mention when they come, and and, and that's obviously a joy. Then mm. that means it is working. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, it, it's it's certainly. Um, yeah, there's some interesting. Well, we haven't had enough sunny sunny days. It's a beautiful sunny day, so I'm just starting to see more stuff all of a sudden <laughs> coming out. It's quite it's quite a good day to be walking around. That's it. So is, is there anything you wouldn't include in terms of like aggregates and things? Is there anything you avoid putting in? Um, well, I guess uh, road, chi road chippings, um, more, we've trialled road chippings um, as a road planings, as, a, as an aggregate. But yeah. I think because they're an oil based thing, the, the nutrient level in them actually is too high. Uh, so we end up with them being, they, they, they stuff growing too well. So probably not that. I mean, I, well, the one thing I would say is uh, always err on the port. It's like, you, it's very rare we've found a substrate that's, that's, that's too low, low in nutrients and too poor. Yeah. Um, now obviously, sometimes you have to accept the first year you sow that particular aggregate, it's not going to be a showy thing in the first year. I mean, you could use a few annuals, I guess, but mm -hmm. if you're patient, the, the, the landscapes that look fairly, you know, that the, the, the don't look too exciting in the first year or so always become the best landscapes, I've mm -hmm. found, from, certainly from a biodiversity point of view. So if you can just 
get your, your client's expectations in line and, and understand that um, and maybe add some structural elements to add some interest while this is happening, mm -hmm. um, then they become the best habitat. And yeah. we've certainly learned that. If you've got some patients in the medium term, they always come good. So sure. for instance, this mound that runs up, um, so there's a mound that runs all the way up here, um, and this is purely crushed concrete and crushed ceramic. So that's toilet sinks and all those kind of, that, all that waste material. Uh, and that has, this has now become uh, quite an interesting plant mix because this is probably quite a bit more stressy. Yeah. And I know we talked about this native, non-native thing earlier now, and, and certainly yeah. as you can see, we've put a mixture of both in this. Um, and so, although some of it's a little bit jarring, <laughs> and maybe some of it we could uh, pick away at from an aesthetic point of view, yeah. it's really quite interesting the, the way that the, the two, the natives and the non-natives function perfectly happily together. And there's nothing particularly, and if you look into it, there's nothing dominating the space, yeah. which is the crucial thing. Especially after such a long period of time yeah. as well. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's really nice to see um, how this is developing and still, and if you look at things like the yarrow and that over there, you can see they're under a bit of stress so that mm -hmm. the foliage isn't too lush and, and there's, there's, there's space between things. And if you look through, I mean, that's got a pretty good aesthetic considering the, the maintenance of this stuff is so low. Yeah, but know? I think that's one of the things people might not realize that with a lot of wildflower mixes where they are sown on um, topsoil, um, well, not necessarily topsoil, but you would always want to sow them on a lower mm. nutrient mix. Mm. But when you try and get them on roadside verges or wherever else, you have to keep cutting them and removing them um, once the seeds have dropped yeah. to be able to keep the nutrients low or it becomes too rich and you just end up with nettles. Yeah, it's a battle. And that is a huge yeah. battle, yeah. And yeah. It's, there's a huge cost there in terms yeah. of carbon, the people yeah. coming back to do it, which is what we keep going back to. But also there's a huge cost there in terms of maintenance. Um, and it's a real challenge to try and do that. Um, and keep it going, especially for councils as they're being more and more, yep. you know, strapped for cash. Yeah, no, exactly, and exactly the, that. And you know that's not going to happen most yeah, of, a lot of the time. Indeed, indeed. So they, you, you do wonder whether that's, in, but a little bit of, inve well, not even that much of an investment. I guess it's more of an investment in time and thought before these things happen so that yeah. we can dictate the soils that go in because that essentially really controls the vegetation. Well, it can solve a lot of Completely problems. controls the vegetation, yeah. doesn't it? That's it. Um, and we've also just started to trial um, in some industrial waste. So this mound here, this is um, uh, calcium carbonate. So essentially this is chalk. This comes from Tate and Lyle uh, sugar factory. And they, have, they filter the sugar cane through this stuff. Huh. And then it comes, and then they have 11,000 tons a year that are waste, that's waste. That they, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's difficult to, um, uh, to, 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 to know what to do with. So we've just started to trial this and it looks to me, unfortunately, like the, the sugar cane that's left, which is about 3% that's left within the chalk, is meaning that this is actually becoming a little bit of a lush uh, space. So this feels at a, a slightly less good. Um, I mean, I'm hoping maybe it will, it will reduce as time goes on, but I, th I should imagine the sugar cane is somehow given that bit of nutrient content that's made yeah. this, because if this was pure chalk, this wouldn't be doing, this wouldn't be as lush as this. Yeah. Um, the other big thing about using substrates, and this is again what we've learned in probably the last two or three years, is it very much depends on what's underneath. Mm -hmm. So what we've, what we've found is that the nutrient uptake between, so say if you put 400 mil of, of your material on top of, I mean most of the time we take the topsoil off, so even, but, but it's still going onto clay. So if we put 400 mil of sand on top of our clay here, um, there's an incredible nutrient um, transfer from the mm -hmm. clay up into the sand. Yeah. So the, the, base, the, the, the base material that you put the substrates on, it will completely change the way that sand or that substrate works. So for instance, at the car park that we've been working on, the sands went on top of a 10 inch or eight inch layer of type one. So it sort of separated mm -hmm. the substrate from the, the base clay. And the growth there is way, way lower and much more stressed. And we've done the same thing in, the, there's a new, the new garden here, which we can look at in a sec. Same thing, same time with the same materials, but on a clay base mm -hmm. without that separation. And uh, the, the, the growth is probably three, four times more. Oh, wow. So there's an incredible, we, this is something we didn't even think about. So there must be a, there's a, a, a I guess from an osmosis or whatever reason it is, but it's incredible um, uptake and transfer mm. of nutrients from the base layer in, up into the sand. 
<clears throat> Strange. Yeah, and it definitely is the case, because as I say, if we have a chance to look at the car park, you'll see the same vegetation, the same seed mix on the same sand, and it's completely different. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we're finding that it's a lot. So that's quite a big deal, and we, we didn't realize that was happening. Hmm. Yeah, um, I wonder, because different plant species obviously have different root structures, so some pull nutrients up, that's what trees do, they pull lots yeah. of nutrients up to the surface. Yeah. I think it's because, I think what we need to do if we want to make this probably work better is to have a, a kind of a, a no-fines thin substrate on top of the base layer uh, that separates that so that there's not that capillary action, mm. that's transfer of, of water between the two because yeah. even on plants that don't have deep roots, they start to behave like they've got lots of fertility in that oh, sand. Right. It's really, uh, really interesting. So that I think if you want to keep the fertility down, there's probably a case for having a base layer of something that keeps that, with, that hasn't got fines in it, that stops that um, transfer, transfer, you know? Yeah. That's a, this is all guessing, obviously. We yeah. haven't had anything formally done, but that's definitely what's happening, <laughs> I'd say. This is a garden, this garden here, um, this is the one we've, so we built this this spring. Um, okay. So, uh, and, we, and we've got the chalk in here and it's this is the trial we're doing for UEL mm -hmm. um, to see the chalk as against the topsoil so we've got a piles of topsoil in here um, which you'll be able to you'll be able to you could able to tell where the topsoil is straight away <laughs> this is the chalk yeah and this was sown with a seed mix from Salisbury Plain a, obviously is a traditionally a, a well-known chalky uh, uh, a place and, a, and, a, and obviously a good place for um, uh, for flora, yep. uh, and this is the topsoil control sown with the same seed mix. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, obviously, uh, the topsoil contains, I mean, it's quite an impressive array of uh, biodiversity going on here. That, yeah. that, that amount of weed seeds and ruderals in, in one chunk of topsoil. Mm -hmm. So you can see nothing really from the seed mix has managed to break through that. And that's, there's no, there is no weeds in that, and, and that's nearly all, all ruderals and weeds. So. That's the case for inner weed-free substrate to direct sow into. You know what I mean? Mm. You, then you're virtually guaranteed that your seed mix is going to work because yeah. everything in there is what was in the seed mix. Because if obviously, I mean, to be fair, landscapers would never do this. They'd obviously prep the soil, mm. let, the, let the weeds come up and then take them away, to be mm. fair to um, <laughs> professional landscapers. But even so, it's very difficult to get topsoil in a weed-free condition to sow, isn't yeah. it? And it's yeah, quite definitely. a tricky process and it of, often involves chemicals and yeah. herbicides. In fact, it definitely does, I'd say. Yeah. Um, so if you can use inert uh, mineral soils and construction waste, you eliminate that preparation work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Which means you can direct sow, and if you direct sow, that's the lowest carbon form of landscaping, isn't it? Because you've got a seed packet in your hand. Exactly, yeah. And that's it, no plastic, no pots, no compost, no nothing. So um, I'm guessing uh, that uh, that's where one of, the, one of the real advantages of using these materials is that fact that you've got that opportunity to direct sow. And the cost, of course, is minute. I mean, this is, you know, we sowed this, this is what, I don't know, 30 quid worth of seed, I guess. So, and that's what, four or five pots, yeah. <laughs> four or five plants. Um, so this is the area that, um, if we get a chance to go and have a look at the car park, we've done exactly the same in the car park as we've done here, but yeah. this sand is on top of soil. Whereas in the car park, it's on top of type one. Mm -hmm. And you can see we sowed this in April only and stuff is just, well, it's growing way too well. So this is not good. <laughs> it looks good. And from a, say, garden, looks good, yeah. from a garden point of view, it will look amazingly showy, but it will need gardening to mm. make it good. The, 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 but in, so my kind of holy grail is to get this diversity of, of plant community into public space and, in a, and on a realistic maintenance budget. Yeah. Well, this is never going to do that because mm -hmm. this will just get dominated by a few species and it will, it will, and it will need gardening. Yeah. Um, so this is not working from a public space point of view, but if you've got some sort of a budget for gardening, and this is the other thing that's been thrown up by the work we've been doing, if you use this inert substrate on top, you then can sow into a weed-free substrate. You get amazing germination, as you can see, with hardly any weeds. Um, and then when those plants hit the hit the soil underneath or when the, the nutrients start to, to pull up from underneath, you get the growth that you would normally get in topsoil. Yeah. Right? So you get all the advantages of no topsoil with, uh, and, and, and the advantages of, of having topsoil. So you get the nutrients, but you get the loose material on top, the weed-free material, mm -hmm. 
You can garden it really easy in the first year because it's easy to pull weeds out. They grow a bit slower than standard. And then once all the plants you want have hit the nutrient layer, they grow obviously vigorously and then they swamp out where other weeds are going to come in. So from a gardening point of view, this is quite cool. Yeah. If you, if you want to garden somewhere, if you imagine giving this to someone and saying, you know, um, if that was a piece of topsoil, that would take a lot of looking after. Mm -hmm. Whereas this way, I mean, that's hardly any work from my point of view. Yeah. And if you just garden it now to, to make sure you keep the ones you want and, and let the ones you want dominate, that's going to be a very showy, very kind of, uh, 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 you know, colorful space and much easier than if it was just topsoil. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of feed into general landscaping maybe with this. Yeah, no, well, it's, it's really important. You know what I mean? And, and think again, this is the way things have to go. And we've got to be smarter because you know, we were talking um, when we had a little break earlier about skill shortages and things like that. And there is a skill shortage in terms of gardening mm. and gardeners and landscapers, all this type of thing. And, um, you know, so we're going to have to have smarter solutions as well yeah. to like spread their time around yeah. and all this type of thing. And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. especially if communities are involved, people are busy, they can't always, you know, manage things. No. Um, so if it's able to take a bit of that um, time requirement out, it's, uh, yeah. well, you know, it's uh, a huge boon. The, the other thing I, th I thought about is the fact that if you've got an area, say a community garden uh, space or a space that, you know, needs to be t looked after and, and, and there's not loads of maintenance, um, and it maybe is a, a, a brambly, uh, nettly dock sort of area, you know, high nutrient area. You, if you literally just laid a piece of geotextile over it and then you brought in your, your, your sand or your construction waste, and just literally just put it straight on top of the mat, you could then do that, direct sow it, have an amazing looking garden. You've suppressed all that aggressive stuff underneath because of the mat and you've got the nutrient exchange through the mat. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. you then, by that simple, no chemicals, no spraying then, you know, you're not digging out the nettles and docks forever. Just simply put a mat over it and then put the material on top and then you're going to, you're going to create incredibly biodiverse space if, if, and, and, and so much easier to garden with all the advantages of the nutrients from the soil from That's an it. aesthetic point of view. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah, indeed. I just wanted to highlight this post while we're here because the amount of insects on this post is quite impressive. Yeah, well, I think the big thing to say about um, bee post and this is obviously uh, this is what I suppose traditionally in garden center it would be called a bee hotel um, so one is it's a simple post um, there's two things to say about it is uh, the, one of the most important things is to drill different size holes so mm -hmm. when you buy a bee hotel from a garden center it's bamboo bamboo mm -hmm. usually is seven mil to nine mil size so highest hole well there is probably three quarters of the aerial nesting bees that don't like that, don't want that size of the big holes. So we drill holes from two and a half mil up to eight mil. And if you do that, just that simple process of giving that variation, you're gonna get all these different species. So you've got resin bees here, you've got leaf cutter bees, you've got mason bees, because they all need different size holes. And if you don't put different size holes in, you won't get them. Yeah. Because these smaller bees won't nest in the big holes, obviously, because they're gonna use them way more, too much energy filling them up. Yeah. It just doesn't, they don't use them. And the other thing to do is to think about if you possibly can, and this is a piece of reclaimed uh, tropical hardwood. Um, you don't have to use this. We use, we use standard pine is, is, is okay, is fine. Um, but the, the, the reclaimed hardwood is so good because when you drill it, you get a very clean hole. Mm -hmm. Bees much prefer that. And the woodpeckers have much more uh, trouble knocking a hole in the side because believe me woodpeckers will want to get if you look at if a woodpecker looks at this he's going to think that's a serious amount of food in there yeah so he's really going to want to get in there where where the so the tropical harbor is really good because they really have a job to get through mm. um, i mean this is just looking at this now is just incredible i mean i've seen hundreds of bug hotels and i've never seen one as you know popular as mm. this one it's just you know because what you don't realize is that these are all bees no, yeah, these are yeah. all different types Absolutely, of bees. You know, yeah. you look at yeah. this, when you think of bees, you think of honeybees, the great big things. Yeah. You know, but actually, these are much smaller different types of bees. There's masses of them. How many species of bees do you say are 20? The, well, there's, there's 250 species of bees that are not honeybees in this country. So, yeah. you know, I mean, so you, and, and uh, you know, two, a third, about a third of them nest in holes like this, yeah. but then two thirds of them nest in the ground, in the sand, which is mm -hmm. what we've been talking about earlier. So if you want to get, you want to get both, you know, a pile yeah. of sand and a post, that's it. And then you've covered most of the bee species if you, <laughs> if you get lucky enough to have them. Uh, but what these, a lot of these ones are a, a species called a resin bee. And the other thing you can see is look how completely harmless these things are. I mean, this is what's so cool about having them in public spaces because they've got a sting of sorts, but it's a weak sting and they don't sting you because they're not a social animal. Yeah. They're not defending the nest, they're a solitary animal. 
And these things are so cool because what they do is they collect resin from tree resin and then they, they, they seal the hole off with tree resin and then not only do they seal it with tree resin, which is a pretty foul safe way of stopping predators getting in, they then pebble dash it with stone. So you can see these tiny stones are the little tiny uh, granite chippings from the park. <laughs> so they literally pebble dash wow. the stone. So there ain't no, there's no way, can you see it? Look, yeah, it's yeah. literally pebble dashed. So there's no way a predator is going to get in there. It's, yeah. like, a, it's like a fortress. <laughs> So, you know, quite wonderful. And I mean, you'd never see that going on. No, you, you wouldn't. How would you ever, I've it's never, going I've on. I've never seen that. You know, and you can see the leaf cutter ones up here. Yeah, the leaf cutters, yeah. leaf cutters assume, exactly, with all the leaves. exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and the thing is, this is a public space thing, right? Yeah, it? it is, oh, like We've put it on a galvanized support. It's not gonna rot for 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. This could be a bollard, couldn't it? This could be a oh, piece yeah. of infrastructure that happens to be, have holes drilled in it. So that's again, going back to what we said now about, you know, making these things function as a piece of infrastructure, but actually um, give niches for, for wildlife. So it doesn't have to be a post in my garden. It can be a, a bollard. It can be anything, basically. Yeah, well, the made thing is, we're, we're looking at things like this as, um, as features, um, you know, behind, if there's a windy area or something, putting these in with a trellis or something so yeah, yeah, yeah. plants can climb yeah, up yeah. it as well. Again, you get that kind of aesthetic yeah. look and, it's, and people might not even notice this, yeah. you know, and it becomes really functional. You know, you yeah. can have this on the back of the post, for example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so people don't necessarily yeah. see it, but it's there playing a really important role. Yeah, and I, and I, I think, you know, it, it's, it, we've, um, we've also just started to look, which we can have a look at next, actually, we've just started to look at acoustic fencing as well. So that's oh, another, there's another piece of infrastructure that you've kind of got to have and is going yeah. in in thousands of kilometers of it oh, all God, over. Yeah. So, so we've, we've just messed around with how we can maybe integrate habitat into some of those. So we can have a look at that. And I guess this is the, um, we touched on this earlier about um, tidying up rubble. So this is literally, obviously demolition waste from our local area. I buy this from a mile away. Uh, but if we put that in a pile along there, it would look pretty poor. Mm. If you just package it in a gabion, which is a, a pretty relatively low energy, there's not a lot of steel involved in these, in these cages. <laughs> um, and you're, to, you're also talking about a 60 year lifespan on these things, aren't you? And, yeah. and again, that's, that's, that's a subject that we haven't quite touched on, which again is another quite big deal, I think, is the, this whole thing about sustainability and, and, and carbon is totally dependent really on well, not totally dependent, but one of the big factors of it is the fact of how long this stuff lasts, isn't it? So if we're replacing exactly. stuff, that's a lot of carbon, mm -hmm. isn't it? Retrofitting is a lot of carbon. Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that what we do at the start is something that's actually going to last. Yeah. You know, these things are going to last 60 years, finish. They're an incredibly important habitat for, uh, for uh, spiders, especially. Great place for things to warm up on and quite a nice piece of infrastructure to give you an edge to something, you know, That's way it. better than a standard. And, and if people are doing things like this at home, you can use such a range of materials. You know, I've seen some with old broken plant pots filled yeah, up and stacked up, anything. tiles, all sorts of things. Yeah. And again, that creates a very different habitat within, within yes, this. Yes, of course. So, of course. you know, you yeah. can get such yeah. a range of things even yeah. within this and a bit well, of artwork. We, <clears throat> we use sheep's wool in, in, on our um, cycle shelters. We, we, we put small gabions up full of sheep's wool and then the birds use that to nest pull out to nest with. So there's all sorts of things. Essentially, gabions are just a good way of packaging material, aren't they? Yeah. A really useful way of packaging material. Exactly. Um, so yeah, I'm really hoping, we haven't got any uh, common lizards here. I'm really hoping one day I'm gonna <laughs> see a common lizard on top of this thing. I always think of it as a, like a, it feels to me like an, an Essex dry stone wall, that does. <laughs> you know, it's like a dry stone wall without the effort. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, we, so we looked at the, uh, uh, the prototype of the what we're calling a bee sand planter, but uh, it was that whole idea of getting sand into urban places, which obviously is very difficult. You can't just tip up sand in a in a street and expect the bees to nest in it. Um, so we've taken it from that perforated steel prototype into a product now. So uh, this has got holes in the front, the same as the perforated steel had, but holes that are, have a little bit of design to them. Obviously, you can plant the top, so it becomes a planter, a piece of street furniture. And then we've also slapped on um, uh, some chestnut logs with, uh, uh, drilled for aerial nesting bees. So there's ground nesting bees nesting through here into the sand, and there's aerial nesters that nest in the hole. And then you can plant this with whatever you want, <laughs> obviously. So again, another piece of street furniture. We talked about bollards earlier, bollards, planters. All these things go into streets, scapes. Um, but we can get them to function on more than one level which is again, what we were suggesting earlier. Exactly, and the thing is as well, when you have a very urban environment, 
there often isn't that there isn't space for lots of to have dead wood and log piles and all no. that type of thing. No. So this creates an alternative way of introducing that. Yeah, it's into a sanitized wild... way. To yeah, extent. exactly. Yeah, but it has yeah. to be to fit into that environment. It does it? exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and, it's, yeah. and it's such a good way, and people understand it then as well, because as you said, some of these things yeah. can have information boards and them or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We always put interpretation on the back. Unfortunately, exactly. my uh, my garden maintenance is not what it should be, so uh, <laughs> this has got a bit out of hand. But and certainly on a street, you wouldn't have that issue. And yeah. uh, we always put a, an interpretation panel on the back of these mm -hmm. as well on the on the north side. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, so what, uh, we, what we've done on this post is essentially use bamboo for the bigger holes and then yeah. we've just drilled the smaller holes on the post so then you get the both again. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we were talking about as the acoustic wall. So I've, we're building my son a, a sound studio behind here and we thought, mm -hmm. well, well, why don't we do mess around with a, an acoustic wall that might um, uh, you know, help to uh, uh, mediate the sound a bit. So this is a, uh, an eight inch wide fence, essentially just eight inch posts um, again, with the perforated steel that we talked about earlier, just fixed to it uh, and then packed with sand. Mm -hmm. So again, the bees nest in through the holes in, in, in the perforated steel and, and that mass of sand is an incredibly good acoustic barrier. So that, you know, I'm not saying you, 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 know, you replace the whole of the acoustic fence in with that, but if you just add a few panels of those in, oh, you'd yeah. have some potential for habitat. And of course, plants grow very well on top of it as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you've got all those elements going on on what would be a sterile place normally. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, it makes so much sense. And, it, and as we said, it adds so much interest, you know. Yeah. Again, you know, having a more diverse landscape, a bit yep. of a change in material is, yep. is really interesting. Yeah, and I mean, we've, you, we've got quite a lot going on here. So we've got obviously gabions, we've got acoustic wall, we've got buried logs, we've got topography change, which is the other big thing. So if possible, don't rake everything flat. If possible, get some topography in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the substrate, because then you get damper areas, drier areas, and you get that lovely variation, which is, mm -hmm. is good for uh, uh, diversity. And again, this is, this is uh, construction waste on top of soil. So you can see way too much growth. The first couple of years, I was very excited about this. Now I'm less excited. I mean, obviously this year has been, it's made things a lot more intense because of the rainfall. Mm. But um, I'm gonna it'd be interesting to see what happens to this next year if we have a drier year, just to see yeah. how it performs. But you can see that, that there's no way this amount of growth would be happening just in the construction waste so that mm. must be picking up from the area from the soil underneath um but again like we said there's potential for that to be good and bad you know i mean yeah. it, 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 you know it's uh, this area is slightly different because we scraped off more of the topsoil uh, and then we and we've got slightly more depth of construction waste on here so you can see there's a much lovelier more open uh and more diverse space and very much lower maintenance mm -hmm. so i haven't got to do much with this and you can see it's absolutely cr crawling with um, invertebrates and bees. Yeah, um, it really is. It's amazing to see so many. But again, I think that's because you've got the you've got a good mix of not only the wildflowers but also the habitat. Because if yeah. you didn't have that, they'd have to be travelling a much greater distance yeah. and all that type yeah. of thing. You wouldn't get colonies here, and you've probably got things coming from, as you said, you already know. Yeah, I hope so. You'd hope away. so, wouldn't you? Yeah. And I guess the other thing is that open mosaic habitat, which is a, which is a is an incredibly diverse habitat is really underplayed in landscape, I think, mm. isn't it? You know what I mean? We don't actually design it in very much, do we? It's no. one of those landscapes that's got, or one of those natural features that's got missed, I'd say, a bit within the landscape industry. So designing open mosaic back into a landscape, in, in, you know, it doesn't have to be all like this, but certainly pockets of this within a scheme would be really cool to do. Definitely. Right? Well, I think this is one of the things that's come up a lot on this podcast generally, is that we need a better mosaic across the landscape right. because actually you know so many things are so sterile we were talking earlier about actually you gave a great example of a car park and a agricultural field the comparison of the two yeah 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 well i mean uh, you know there's been a lot of research done into to <laughs> and it turns out that a, a piece of infrastructure even like a standard uh, multi-story car park has more invertebrate activity than the center of a farm in arable field and uh, you know it, when you hear it like that, it's quite astonishing, but that's mm. obviously true because there's no structure, there's no niches, is there? There's no, no breeding exactly. space. Yeah, it's all often sprayed as well, which obviously uh, doesn't help. Exactly. So, you know, it's, you know it's in a multi-story big... car park, it's probably less, less herbicide yeah. and less uh, pesticide for sure. That's it. Um, probably disturbed less yeah. in a way. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. And way more, just edges, way more sort of little places for things yeah. to get. And I think uh, the structural elements, like we've said earlier, are vital. There's no mm. way this landscape would be anywhere near as good without this variety of structure. Mm -hmm. If it was just flowers, fine, it looks pretty and all that, but it's nowhere near as good for wildlife. Uh, and obviously the structure can extend up to a green roof, which obviously a lot of people know and is becoming, you know, I mean, 
pretty much in London now is a, is a, is a, pretty much a standard. default standard now. Yeah. But there's green roofs and there's green roofs, as we all know, and uh, structure on a green roof is a really important thing, and that's been underplayed again, so there's no reason why you can't have log piles, gabions, sand piles, all that should be on a roof as well as some plants. Yeah, a bit of undulating landscape as Absolutely. well. You don't want it just flat. No, and you, yeah. can, you can load parts of the roof uh, thicker where the, the supporting columns are underneath, so you can get round the loading issue often by just mm. putting the material where the, where the supporting columns are. Uh, and also, most green roofs this year is a really an exception. So if you're going to look at a green roof, this is the year to look at one because there's never been a year like this. I mean, that roof up there, for instance, it, you know, it's never going to be as green as that in, July, in, in August um, normally. So most green roofs will brown off, in the, in yeah. the, obviously. Um, so the structural elements are actually going to give it that element of interest as well mm. from an aesthetic point of view. So that you can make the structure actually work when the plants die or yeah. when the plants you know, uh, brown off. So we, we actually went to look at a green roof with Dusty, Dusty yeah. Gedge. We've done an episode with him on green roofs. But we went just before we had all the wet weather. Okay. So it had all been quite dry and it had all been overtaken with chives and all that type yep, of thing where yep, they managed yep, to yep, sort yep, of survive yep, that dry yep, weather. Yep. But it's interesting because you see that it is a, you know, there's a mosaic of plants there. And obviously those plants respond very differently. So mm. you get that change in species as well, depending yeah. on weather. Yeah, you so do. So you do get, yeah, and, and it, that adds quite, interest as well. You know? Yeah, yeah, you do. But if you, if you get that variation in soil depth on a green roof, then you've got you'll get that more of a variation of plants, mm. obviously. If you just have a single depth, which is what most green roofs are like, obviously, yeah. then if that one particular plant is going to die at that stress level, it's going to die all over the roof, isn't it? Exactly, Because the, yeah. the, the soil's the same, yeah. isn't it? There's no resilience to no. it. Yeah. Um, so no, yeah, this is, the, this is the year for green roofs, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, so just to talk about maybe the, the, the substrates slightly, so this area here, so in front of this bench, this area in this space is all crushed Lovely. concrete, pure yeah. crushed concrete. And you can see we, we, we put some wild thyme in here. Mm -hmm. And um, wild thyme, as you probably know, there's no way it's going to be able to survive out there in, with, that element, with that level of competition, because it generally only survives when rabbits are keeping everything down on chalk downland. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you give it the stress of pure crushed concrete, you eliminate quite a few of the other plants from the equation. So therefore the thyme can really, and thyme absolutely, you can see, it grows like crazy in crushed concrete. Because mm -hmm. essentially that's chalk, isn't it? You yeah. Know? So um, we're giving it what it wants, aren't we? And we're also saying we don't want things to grow tall here because there's a bench here. We want yeah. it to grow low. So we've designed in that element mm -hmm. by the substrate, haven't we? Yeah. Um, it makes so much sense when you think about it, but it's not something you'd ever necessarily think of really. No, you know. no, and, 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 and it also, the other thing I think it does is like using very low fertility substrates like crushed concrete, it, it allows you to design in space between your plants. So if you want to open the vegetation up and give some space, you can say, right, I'm going to have a reel of crushed concrete running through the center. That's going to give me that permanent open mm -hmm. space. And that's quite a nice design element to have, isn't it? Otherwise, it is, yeah. you've got to garden that in, haven't you? Exactly. You know what I mean? You can only make these things happen by gardening normally. Mm -hmm whereas you can make them happen by the soil, you know? I said, well, it's a, sm it's a smart way of gardening, really, isn't it? It's a, well, foresight, I would say. A foresight in how you plan things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which can save you so much time and energy. And of course, you can get a lot of this done when, uh, at the construction phase. Yeah. That's the other thing. So you can utilize your construction digger drivers and, and they don't have to know a lot about plants. Uh, they just, you know, we, you can just get them to use the materials they're using for construction mm -hmm. into the landscape at that point in time, which is going to be a money saver. Oh imagine. yeah. Well, there's so many problems and costs associated with taking stuff away. Yeah. You know, using stuff on site is, you know, everyone's interested Makes in purpose. it now, yeah, but it's yeah. how you do it. And this is what we were talking about earlier as well, is there's, there's such a challenge around how you design these things because the big problem we have as designers is often we don't have the time to necessarily figure all of these things yeah. out and yeah. it's how do we where do we go to get this information how readily available is this yeah. information and how yeah. we can help promote it to other people yeah. you know it's a big it's a big challenge yeah, especially as you know there's not been a lot of research in some of these areas no. No. so it's you know it's a huge opportunity for clients and designers to mm. really improve the environment save carbon in lots of innovative Absolutely. ways and save money as well it does, on maintenance it, it does as they say tick yeah. every box it so does it, it really does, does pretty yeah. much so um we uh, we had a chat really about uh, you know this whole thing about getting sand or getting nesting into urban places and uh, and then we wondered whether we could um, incorporate some sort of structure that gave you the nesting habitat just above the vegetation so you could mm -hmm. this could go into a border or into a planting yeah. scheme you know where you and you basically just lift in the, the breeding space up mm -hmm. uh, now 
We're still at the prototype stage with this and there's only been, so far, only two or three bee species that have been using it and they're the tinier bee species and I'm, we're guessing that's because the bigger bee species need more mass of sand. Mm. You know what I mean? This is probably not enough mass of sand, so it's probably only going to work with the smaller species, but we don't know quite. You know, that's the joy is that of trying the depth stuff. of burrow they need to create? Yeah, or? I mean, they, they create, they, I mean, there's, there, there's many meters of burrow they create. Oh, wow. Yeah, many meters. Uh, and often they have a central um, burrow and then the chambers come off the side of that. Oh, wow. So I'm guessing that's nowhere near enough mass of sand for mm -hmm. some of the bigger species. Which, Interesting. You know, these, that's the yeah, reason you try thing, this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's an important thing to consider because, again, you know, um, I don't have a particularly big knowledge of bees, so it's interesting to find out that they mm. actually need that much space because you think bee, tiny, it no, needs, no, a, little, it needs no. a little bit of sand, you know. Yeah. Um, it can burrow you know, a few inches in or yeah. something and that's enough. But actually, <coughs> well, yeah, but as you point out, they need a hell of a lot more than that. Yeah, um, also, the other thing is I think we, we, uh, they're very, very, um, the, 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 the temperature of the, of the sand as well, it, it, that's an incredible uh, important thing for the bees as well. And they pick areas with the right temperature of sand and it might be that, you know the sand that sand might be warming up too much it might mm. be getting a bit too warm because it's not it's not got the the coolness of a sub base who knows i mean we're just that's why we, that's why you try stuff in it exactly yeah. yeah that's a good point let's see because it is really interesting to see i mean i've seen your videos on facebook and yeah. things, but it doesn't it obviously doesn't compare to actually being here it's no, really no, it's, no, it's, it's uh, well, it's, I think it's a slightly bigger space than people expect. I oh, think, it definitely uh, is, yeah. I mean, I didn't expect it to be anywhere as big as this. No. The only thing I have noticed that you, you don't have much of, you've obviously got the big pond up there. Yeah. You don't have much water around. Uh, well, there's a big pond at the bottom. Oh, is there? Which you can't really, you can have a, I mean, we could have a quick look at that, but it's not really, I suppose it's a pond like every other pond. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've got another pond at the, right at the top, in the, in the trees at the, at the top. But certainly that would be, I mean, you can never have enough ponds, can you? I mean, no, exactly. Yeah. That, and yeah. I'm on clay here, so I could dig them anywhere, <laughs> in theory. We, we've, well, I'll tell you what we have tried. We've tried some uh, ephemeral wetlands. Oh, okay. um, so we've dug some scrapes that obviously fill up with water in the winter and then dry out in the summer. Yep. So along here. So this tends to fill up and then overflow into that. And you can see there's a, still a little bit of water left in this one and there's some water left in the last one. Oh yeah. So again, this was another case of, um, it's that cool thing about working, and we haven't really touched on this, but that whole thing about working with entomologists mm -hmm. with the landscape. So, you know, using the entomologist as the kind of the driver of the landscape design. And uh, so James, uh, the guy we work with, um, he's, he's obviously said, well, you haven't got any ephemeral wetland, you haven't got any bits of um, wetland that dry out in the summer. Loads of species evidently need this to happen. Loads mm -hmm. of species need it to be wet in the winter, dry in the summer. Um, mm -hmm. So we've just added a few scrapes. And again, you, you know, we've just done it randomly with, with, a, with a digger bucket. But you could design this again in, yeah. in a proper, in a, in a more design way, in a way that works. And again, ephemeral wetlands, very overlooked and underplayed, I'd say. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then quite an important habitat. Oh, definitely, um, yeah. Well, this type of thing will happen more with sustainable drainage and things like that yeah, in cities. Yeah, you'll have the potential be... for that, wouldn't you? Exactly, but do, yeah. do, 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 I don't know whether in, with the drain... I haven't seen many such systems where they allow the water to, to fill up in the summer. Is there? Um, so much, probably or not, maybe no, on a, on a bigger scale. On a maybe bigger on a, scale, you might have a like bigger a detention holding pond, pond or yeah, something, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, but other, but yeah, and interesting, really. and again, I think if you work with an entomologist, like what we did with James here, so when we first met James about five years ago, he, he uh, surveyed the garden and he told us what we had good amounts of, and he, but he told us groups of invertebrates and mm -hmm. niches of invertebrates that we didn't have. And then he told us what they needed. Mm -hmm. And then that's the key, isn't it? And then yeah, you can exactly, say, yeah. right, okay. Well, and what he, James isn't good at, and he won't mind me saying this, because I don't know, I don't know, you know, I, I certainly couldn't ID the bugs, <laughs> is that he's not going to be, have the practical skills to design that into a new landscape. So you, mm -hmm. you need the combination of landscape architect uh, and practitioner, I guess, and entomologist, you know, and that, that combi is quite a cool thing. Yeah, and the other cool. thing to, I always think to remember is if you, if you deliver invertebrates, if you deliver the biodiversity, the diversity of invertebrates, everything else comes for free. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the bees and the bats and all those other things because they all f really stem from the invertebrate population, don't they? You know what I mean? Yeah, so if a landscape is diverse for invertebrates, it's pretty much going to be good for everything else. So no, I think true. that's quite a nice thing to think about when we're designing instead of Definitely, having to think yeah. about too many things, you know. Anyway, this is the pond. So we've played around with just leaving uh, scraping an area and letting ruderals come in. 
-hmm. which is uh, quite a bit jarring from an aesthetic point of view, but James gets very excited about that from a bug <laughs> point of view. But that wouldn't be a public space thing. Anyway, this is, so we're on clay here, so it's a... Uh, um, Proper pond. It's a pretty easy, it was an easy pond to dig. We just dug it and, and it, you know, it fills up with water, so we didn't have any line or anything to worry about. Mm. So. Uh, what we do have is some, um, you know, we've got quite a lot of great crested in here as well. Oh, wow. Um, well, to be fair, I've got great crested newt in this part of Essex is pretty much, it's everywhere, <laughs> they're everywhere. No, it's not, it's not something completely clever we've done. They are pretty, pretty good populations in this, in this part right. of Essex. I have to confess, it's the first time I've ever been to Essex. Right. The furthest I've right. ever been this way. Right, right, right. Oh, you've been missing out. South <laughs> Essex. South Essex, that's, a, that's an under, underrated place if ever I heard one. <laughs> Of course, it's, uh, it's a place that, um, that has been uh, dumped on and gravel pits and chalk pits and all those things have happened in the past. Well, of course, we're getting payback for all that now. Yeah. Because we've got, we've got landfill parks now, which is new green space, which never normally happens. Mm. And we've got nature reserves in gravel pits, haven't we? So, That's it. We're going this way. Yeah. We well, can have a little look at that shelter if you like. Yeah, definitely. Only reason I'm coming this side because this is where all the bees are. It's covered in ah. bees this side. If you want to get, it's some... good to show the difference though. Well, if you want to get some images of some bees, there's quite a lot of bees going on here. Uh, and this is the interpretation that we've, we, 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 so we, we always put interpretation on these as well. So this is made for six wheelie bins, um, and we keep it here as a uh, obviously another as a trial to see what happens to the building over time. So this has been here about seven or eight years now. Um, but as you can see, it's still completely full up of uh, solitary bees. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we're adding habitat, we're adding an interpretation, obviously. And it's why we said earlier, it's the fact that people have to go to this, to mm -hmm. put their rubbish in. So it's a great place to educate people, or, well, that sounds slightly arrogant, but to, to allow people to see what, what could be their uh, choice, you know. Yeah. Um, and of course- no, but it's so important, as you say, people have to see these things and understand them to appreciate them. You know, because yeah. if they don't know, if there's no information board, yeah, then yeah. No, I have absolutely. no idea what it is. No, absolutely. I think that's that is pretty, pretty vital, especially when it comes to invertebrates. It's quite uh, tricky to get that thing across otherwise. Yeah, and you can see on this side that the lack of bees, obviously. Yeah, the yeah. Shade, well, they're, they're, the they're less active. So this, the sun would hit this in the morning. So oh, obviously okay. that's that's when they'd be active here, uh, mm. and then they'd be obviously more active here. And you can see the sheep's wall that we put for the bird for bees to use for bird nest for birds to use for nesting. Is, is half empty. So you can see that's constantly being used. How, and how um, often do you fill that up? Did you fill it up when you first built it? Or I assume you yeah, it's it been, up? No, it's been filled up once in seven years, I guess. Yeah, filled up once. So they've oh, used wow. so the whole- so it takes quite a long time for yeah, them to, to use Yeah, because I mean, it. they pull out strands. It's quite, mm. a, you know, it's quite, a, and there's only certain bird species that, that want wool in their nest, obviously. Yeah. Not all bird species use that. Um, but it's quite interesting watching the, the, especially things like blue tits who use it. Mm. And because they're quite a small bird, they get hold of a fibre and then they have to lean so far back to actually get it out of the cage. <laughs> it's quite a weird process for them. <laughs> um, but there's a few, and, and the other thing about, I suppose, we take for granted with, living, with, with green roos is the fact that they're just, they're a piece of soil in an urban environment that then is going to pick up on other plant species that we, I mean, we, for instance, we didn't plant um, this species, this is quite an interesting thing. This is grass vetchling, which is a, uh, an annual um, that grows in, in, often in quite old meadows. It's not mm. that common. So, and that's got quite a heavy seeds. So uh, no idea how it gets up there, but that, yeah. we find that a lot on green roofs, that particular plant. It's really weird why that mm. should be up there. <laughs> um, but it's quite cool that, you know, and, and also the other thing to, to look at is what's also interesting is the, the vegetation on the ground. So, so some of this broom, this grass on the, on the floor, which mm -hmm. we never planted on the roof. Obviously you can see it's on the roof now. Yeah. So the, the, the roof takes on the, 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 uh, the, the look of the landscape around it sometimes, especially obviously on smaller structures like this. Mm. You know, not on the top of Dusty's Barclays Tower, it won't happen <laughs> so much, but it certainly happens, uh, it certainly happens on this scale. That's it. But it just, just demonstrates how important this is for livening up a space. As you said, you know, if this is a bin store on a site, you've immediate, and bin stores typically are in the arse end of a site, of shall course, we say. Of course. You know, it's such an important thing for brightening that space. Yeah. You know, even the metal, you know, really helps brighten the space yeah. up. Yeah. Um, and then you've obviously got all the materials yeah. and things. And as we were talking about earlier, you know, you may not think it when you, when you look at something like this necessarily, but, you know, exposure to timber does have health benefits. So mm. the more you can incorporate it into yeah. different aspects of people's yeah. lives um, and the green, obviously, of the green roof, all these little yeah. things really add up yeah. and have a huge benefit. Yeah, and I think the other thing that we were talking about earlier about the sustainability of something is very, is, is linked a lot to how long something is going to last. So yeah. we were really, 
obsessive about these of making sure that the frame properly galvanized going to last for many many years and mm. the waterproofing under uh, for the roof is no there's not a rubber water it's stainless steel trays mm. now there's a high energy use into producing them in the first place we you know i understand that but 60 years down the line this will still be there and yeah. how many replacements out of a, a poorer quality materials would have ha would have taken place Exactly. Well, you can make the same argument with concrete as well. Yeah. You know, I, some, I know some designers that are using concrete as footpaths, yeah. you know, for, typically for smaller projects, yeah. not huge lengths yeah. of it. Yeah. But their argument is this is a highly intensively used area. Yeah. Actually, this material, while it's not the most um, carbon friendly mm. initially, yeah. over time, it more than pays for itself because it's so resilient. I guess this is, a, this, is a, this is the question that we've, someone's got to deal with regard to it carbon. Isn't yeah. it? How, what, 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 what time what period line, yeah, what's are the we, time frame we're yeah, looking at? How are yeah. we judging carbon? Exactly. Over five years, over 20 years, over 50 years? I don't know. Um, but they, that, that, that definitely needs to be a conversation it it, does, before yeah. we can start being, um, talking sensibly about carbon use. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, that, cause you, there's nothing worse than, and I think this is, you ended up with a bad reputation on some green schemes. It's been a bit kind of, you know, temporary and slightly fluffy and not really, uh, you know, built out of recycled materials, but recycled materials that are going to rot within five years. Mm. Well, that doesn't make sense, I exactly, don't think. Yeah. So, the, the, you know, we, we, I think we really need this combination of robust materials mm. and then we can clad them with the green stuff. Yeah. Because then it's going to last, you know. In the same way as we use sweet chestnut logs instead of standard logs, because they're going to naturally last a lot, lot longer without having to replace them. It's, it's that kind of just little bit of thought about, you know, the longevity of stuff, I think. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned sweet chestnut because that's come up in three episodes of the podcast already okay. as being such an incredibly important yeah, tree species. Yeah, really And useful. one that's really underused. Yeah. So it's got so much opportunity. Well, we're really lucky that Dan and Duncan, the guys that I work with on the show, they, they've got a ship, part share in a little woodland down in oh, do Kent. So we go down there, we coppice the sweet chestnut, oh, we bring nice. it back here, we cut it out and then we drill it. It's a pretty tedious process, I've got to say. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I can't, I can't imagine how many holes we've drilled over yeah, the last bet, 15 years. But it's rather lovely because mm. we've been back to a lot of these shelters that are eight, ten years old, and the chestnut is still fine mm. um, because it's, it's kept in a fairly dry state. I was going to anyway. say, yeah, it's really important to point out that this overhangs it slightly. Yeah, you know, so it allows, yeah. keeps a lot of the rain off. Yeah, allows yeah, it yeah. to dry and there's off. There's no way. There's no places for it to be trapped. In there, exactly. Yeah, the air flows yeah. all the way through. Yeah, it's really important. So we're just at. Um, a car park that you've been involved in designing you yep. know, um, for a, a charity, shall we say, which you can probably see in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you know, you've designed it really innovatively. You've tried to use the substrates we've been talking about and some of the planting solutions we've discussed as well to keep it, um, you know, low carbon, local materials and all that type of thing. So yep. maybe if you could talk us through a bit of what you've done and why. Yeah, yeah. Well, we started off, we had the usual scenario of a huge budget for the building, tiny budget for the, the landscape, which is what we're all used to. Yep. Um, and we were given the plans for the car park very late on, 150 car car park, no planting, no habitat. Mm -hmm. um, and they were passed they were passed in 2020 just like that which is astonishing in my i couldn't even believe that that was happening anyway we were given that so we were we, were, we had very restricted room um yeah. and um and and obviously a tiny budget yeah uh, so we decided to use gabions as a as a our main kind of structural element yeah one because we didn't want to dig any holes to, to because there's a there's bits of asbestos in the site and they didn't want to you know uh, uncover any more as it were so um uh, gabions and we decided if we could to fill them with very local so this is local rubble so in a, what i was really had in my head that this material is local houses local um, houses <laughs> in a cage so yeah. essex houses in a cage mm. and uh, obviously it's not a traditional gabion material but it's way way cheaper obviously and it's not mined and it's not gone miles it's come from a mile and a half down the road um so and i and, I, and once you package it like we were saying once you've packaged yep. it like that People really like it, so mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't have any resistance to it once it had gone into the, to the aesthetic of it. It's really good. Um, uh, but what we did have a problem with and what uh, we was trying to get over was the fact there's no budget for tarmac, thankfully in my case, but anyway, mm -hmm. no budget for, for, for line marking. So to get cars to park obviously where you want them and to pack, get them in tight, we was keen to try and force people to park where we wanted them and we designed a 45 degree angle on the... Um, the Gabians, so series of 45s that would have allowed the cars to, to have to have parked there. Unfortunately, because of planning, they didn't want to go back to planning, we were left with having to do a straight line. Um, 
which is a shame because now it means obviously there's a lot more distance between the cars and you're never going to get as many cars in. But anyway, yeah. that's an aside. I can see you've offset them slightly to show, to try and Yeah, yeah, that. we yeah. try to encourage them, but yeah. as you well know, you know, unless you really are careful with it, yeah. it's not going to happen. People just park everywhere. It's trouble. Um, so, so, that's, so there was two things we did. One, we used uh, rubble from local houses in effect, and two, we used uh, the backfill behind the gabion, which was the only little bit of extra landscape we could actually tap into. Uh, that's sand from the uh, road widening on the A13. So that is sand that's waste from the road widening and very cheap. Um, so we had about 300 tonne of that in behind the gabions. So a very, quite a very simple process. And of course, once that's gone in there, that's a completely weed-free uh, material. So we were able to direct sow that without mm. any preparation, no herbicide, no, no soil prep at all. Um, so that's what we've done. And, and, and the annuals have germinated well and there's a good, good mix of, of perennials. The other thing we wanted to do, we wanted to make sure that people understood that there's a, there's a climate change going on and that we need to look at native plants, yes, on the outside of the car park, but on the inside and on the, on the central spine of the car park, we wanted to plant climate change plants. In other words, stuff that was going to probably be happy in 20, 30, 40 years time. Yeah. Um, and to give the contrast and give the, you know, the public a chance to see the alternatives and see how it worked. So, the central spine is all climate change stuff, no native. And then these garden bays, which were the other big feature of, of the design, we just couldn't get our head around 150 cars without any, any uh, planting or habitat. So we've said to ourselves, right, we're gonna nick back eight parking bays. We're gonna take them back. We're gonna make sure people realize they were parking bays. So we, we made sure we had a solid outline, um, uh, still perimeter to them so that people mm -hmm. understood that and then we're going to plant them and we're going to make them into gardens and habitat. So we're going to replace cars with habitat, mm -hmm. which to my mind, you know, in a massive car park like this, is, this is what should happen. Right. Uh, and this feels like quite a nice little twist on uh, what you could do in a car park. So you, 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 you're making a statement then. Are you? You're saying, look, we, we're trying to devote more space to uh, the ecology and the wildlife of the area, and we're giving people something decent to look at. Um, so the parking bays, I think, are quite a nice symbol of that, and mm -hmm. I think that works pretty, pretty well. Yeah. The thing, is, the thing is, as well to point out, is you don't realise how much material goes into something like this. You know, when you're talking about just the sand, 300 tonnes yeah. of just sand. Yeah. It's an inordinate amount of material when you think about it, to do something that, you know, when you look at a car park, you don't realise how much goes into it, really. No, no, so, that's right. And when you realise you, you can reclaim all that material, it goes back to what we were talking about yeah. earlier, keeping stuff local, cutting carbon, yeah. all these type of things. Well, if you can imagine how many lorry trips that was, the, all the rubble yeah. lorry trips, all the sand lorry trips, I mean, if that was mined material for a gabion, yeah. a gambian stone that would have that could have been from 200 miles away yeah and it's being mined and there's all the energy to mine it in the first exactly. place blah 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 but again there's also all the cost or the cost of that Absolutely. so again you know we're able Absolutely. to produce something that's better ecologically it's more unique because it's unique yep. to the area yeah as a story behind yep. it um and it's cheaper yeah it's cheaper way cheaper i way mean cheaper. this is 12 pound yeah. a ton yeah 12 pound a ton you know so what, what would it be normally well, Gabion stone is, is, I mean, it must, you're talking, I don't know, 20, 30 pound a ton at least. Yes, it's a huge saving. At least, probably more than that, if you buy the, the, depending on the quality and the type of stone. Yeah. Uh, and the sand, I don't know, I think that was about eight pounds a ton because it's a waste, it's a waste from a, from a, a, a high waste project. You yeah. know, and they, they want to get rid of it. Mm. There's too much of it. They yeah. needed to lose it. Um, so, so both those things were really quite nice. So we literally got everything in the infrastructure of this car park from two miles down the road, no mm. more. Um, and um, uh, that, I think that, was, that, that made a key difference. And the fact that it's uh, Essex and the fact that it's, uh, you know, a lot of reclaimed construction waste and stuff, it's got a, you know, a connection with the industry and the development that's going on here, but it's yeah. got a kind of good bit, the good bit of all this waste that we have is that we're able to use it as a landscape material. Exactly, um, which will be lower maintenance too. Absolutely, and, and it's really interesting. And we would, we, 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 again, we touched on this back in the garden, is that the, the uh, substrates that we use on top of, it's the material underneath that tends to dictate as well what happens with the planting. So here we're using the same sand as we were at my house, but it's on top of type one, uh, it's about six to eight inches of type one, so fairly inert material. Whereas in my garden, it's on top of subsoil. Mm. Uh, and there is, we've, we've realized that there's a quite an, uh, an incredible release and exchange of nutrients from the base soil into mm -hmm. the new substrate. Whereas here, um, you can see the seedlings in here have germinated, but they're still very tiny. So that the good news is the nutrient level is still pretty low on this. Yeah. So I'm guessing the second and third years, this is going to look pretty good. The maintenance is going to be low and much better than what it's like in my garden. Because my mm. garden, it's going to need to be gardened. It's yeah. going to need to be looked after. 
Whereas this, I guess, is going to have much less of that. And it's going to remain more open and sparse, which is better for the invertebrates anyway. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. It's ideal. Yeah, and I just want to say thank you so much for no, sharing all of this no. today, sharing no, us no. around and everything. It's I, been really, really interesting. Cool. Not something you see every day. Um, and, it, you know, it's a great case study of how we should be approaching these things. And, you know, I think one of the most important things is the cost savings associated to it. Because, yeah. you know, it's one of those things people often don't think about is the cost of things yeah. until, until it hits them. Yeah. Um, you know, and if people can plan and think, well, actually, we want to try and save a bit of money and do something for the environment. Because people often think doing things for the environment is very expensive. Yeah. Actually, if you do it properly and plan it from the start, be yeah. way cheaper. Yeah, and I think I think we were, again we were saying earlier about this, this this kind of this type of habitat, this sort of open, sparse, open mosaic mm. habitat is incredibly important habitat, but it's something that never very rarely gets designed in. Yeah, it's and something that's missing. Exactly, to, and our, our development and our construction is the perfect place to do that, and the mm. perfect materials to do that with. So that uh, you know, again, it, it makes perfect sense I think to look at that. I mean, we're not suggesting you rip all the topsoil out and don't do that. We're suggesting that this is very rarely used and it should be integrated into uh, construction schemes uh, a lot more and in, within, yeah, within landscapes uh, definitely. because then you've got more diverse habitat mm -hmm. in effect exactly cool okay. yeah well thank you very Thanks much now. and cheers. um hopefully catch up again soon yeah we'll do yeah, cheers. cheers i hope you've enjoyed this episode if you're interested in finding out more about what we have coming up why not check out our trailer which you should be able to see here shortly or in the link below don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with friends and colleagues who may also be interested. A huge thank you to our sponsors, Vectorworks and Beans Accountants, and our incredibly kind supporters, the Birmingham Botanical Gardens and Gillian Goodson Courses, who you may be interested in checking out if you'd like to learn more about garden design and horticulture.